I would like to welcome everyone to the December 10th, 2020 work session of the Narico County School Board. At this time, I would like to make note of Ms. Ogburn's physical absence from today's work session. She has previously notified myself, the chair, that she has requested to participate electronically from a remote location. Our school board policy P2-04-006 electronic participation in meetings from remote locations require a majority vote of the board members present at the primary or central meeting location to allow a board member to participate in a meeting from a remote location. In accordance with the school board policy, do I hear a motion to approve Ms. Ogburn's participation in today's work session from a remote location? So moved. And moved by Mrs. Shea is there second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. Ms. Ogburn's request to participate in this meeting from a remote location has been approved. This meeting is being live streamed on HCPS website. We'll begin our meeting with a roll call. When I call your name, please verbally indicate that you are present. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Here. Ms. Ogburn? Ms. Shea? Here. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that a quorum of the board is physically present and one member is participating electronically from a remote location. I ask that Ms. Ogburn verbally note if you need to leave the meeting and subsequently verbally note when you return. The first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it and the agenda is approved. The next item on our agenda is the closed session. The closed session is necessary for discussion of matters covered under items A1 and A2 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia as amended pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees, and the admission and discipline of specific students, including requests for religious <coughs> exemption from compulsory education, and a request for release from compulsory attendance. Is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second, Ms. Atkins? Second. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. We will now go into closed session. We will reconvene the work session at the conclusion of our closed session. Meeting. Next item on our agenda is the certification of closed session. Is there a motion to certify the closed session? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All in favor, I will do the roll call. Uh, Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The closed session has been certified. Madam Superintendent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, before the first item, I would like to take a moment to introduce our two ASL interpreters who are with us for today's meeting providing interpretation services. We have Catherine Milady and Heather Goodson with us. We welcome them to the meeting and appreciate their being here to provide this important service. All right, for the first item, I'm recommending that the school board approve the readmission of case number 19-20 dash S2, the name of the student has been protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Is there a motion to approve the request of readmission of student case number 19-20-S-2? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The readmission is approved. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Next, I'm recommending the school board approve the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case numbers 20-21-RE5, as well as case number 20-21-RE-6, based on bona fide religious beliefs. Is there a motion to approve the requests for religious exemption from compulsory education for student case? <laughs> with student case number 20-21RE-5 and 20-21-RE-6. Ms. Ms. Ogburn, do you want to say something? Sure, yes, yeah, I move. Thank you so much, Madam. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Kinsella. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The religious exemptions are approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Next, I'm seeking the board's approval for the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 20-21-CA-01. Is there a motion to approve the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 20-21-CA-01? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The release from compulsory attendance is approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the next item, uh, we will have our Henrico County Public Schools Health Committee presentation and update, as is traditional at each of our board meetings and Dr. Beth Teigen and Ms. Robin Gilbert will be coming forward to provide us our health committee update. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. Ms. Robin Gilbert, the supervisor of school health services and I are here again today, as Dr. Cashwell said, to share an update from the HCPS Health Committee. Here's the agenda for today's presentation. We will share highlights from the recent Health Committee meetings. We'll provide a quick review of the pandemic dashboard to include the CDC's school metrics and the thresholds set for the two core indicators. We'll review the data from Monday, December 7th, 2020 for Henrico County, the surrounding localities, and the data for the Central Health District Planning Region, ending Wednesday, November 28th. We'll remind everyone of the future meeting dates of the HCPS Health Committee as well. Ms. Gilbert will now share a few slides with you with the pertinent information. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Cashwell, board. It's nice to see you all again. <laughs> Hope y'all had a nice um, fall break there. As Dr. Tigan and I have indicated, our health committee continues to meet every two weeks with the meeting 12-7 being an added meeting post our holiday break. We have also added a post-break meeting following the winter holiday. After each meeting, our superintendent is updated. Our health indicators and local data is reviewed at each meeting and more information will be shared with you today. As a continued effort to incorporate all aspects of information available for our committee's consideration, the group received mental health data from the Henrico Area Mental Health and Developmental Services on access to youth and family services. The first five months of this fiscal year have reflected an increase in access. The committee also received input from the crisis intervention team in Henrico, reporting a decrease in their referrals. This increase in community mental health access and lower referral rates internally is concerning that our student mental health needs and resource referrals may not be occurring with the decrease in face-to-face -face interaction. This data will help our committee to make recommendations for further interventions to support or recommendations, I'm sorry, to support or students, to support our students while in virtual learning. It would not be a decision-making factor for our recommendation on virtual versus face-to-face -face instruction. 
Our leadership team has worked closely with our employees and families to ascertain input for our learning recommendations. As our survey data from our school families has been tallied, schools are working to provide safe, socially distanced instruction spaces. Our teachers will be provided a six foot social distanced area at the front of their classroom. And while most classes will have desks socially distanced six feet apart, classes at two of our schools with high student return to in-person instruction will be provided a four to five foot social distancing with six feet still being the goal. Families in these few identified situations have been provided this information and have the option to reconsider their decision for in-person learning. HCPS continues to, st to strive to sustain the six foot social distancing in every possible situation. Contact tracing continues for both our employees and our students, both virtual and face-to-face. -face. Since October 22nd, 97 positive COVID cases have been or are currently being followed, and 283 exposures have been asked to self-quarantine. Since our break, we have seen an increase in cases and that subsequent reporting. As of today, HCPS has um, an experienced two what we call clusters or outbreaks of cases. One of these has been at an ancillary building. The other was at a school and was isolated to a support area. We have also had about six reports um, to Vosch, which means we have had three cases at an individual building within a 14-day period. HCPS continues to collaborate extensively with the Henrico Health Department. Most re recently, the CDC provided new guideline recommendations based on quarantining times, which can be implemented as alternatives to their current gold standard of a 14-day quarantine for our exposure cases. And again, these, this is defined as an individual who comes in close contact, which is six feet or closer for that 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period. The two alternatives approved, a seven-day quarantine with a negative COVID test on or after day five. The alternative is a 10-day quarantine with no testing being required. These were considered by our health committee. During the discussion, input was provided by doc both Dr. Avula and our epidemiologist, Ms. Jackson. With the current community transmission at such high levels and with the input of both Dr. Avula and Ms. Jackson, the decision was made to continue to implement the gold standard by CDC for exposures and require the 14-day quarantining period for our HCPS employees or students prior to the return to our school buildings. The committee, along um, with their community partners, will monitor our community data. Uh, we will continue to keep these new options on our agenda for further discussion based on that community data. <coughs> Oh, I'm technologically broken. All right, Beth, save me. It's like someone has control of it on Teams. It's got the red around it, like it's like it's te being Teams, like. Please pardon our technical difficulties as we work to get the presentation going again. It Sean, seems to, to be frozen there. Just one Sean moment, is please. presenting, so if he could forward. It says Sean Conley is presenting at the top of the screen. Mm -hmm. So Sean has to forward it or stop. Excuse me? It looks like it was taken over. Can I 
I'll click on give control. Well, let's see if we can. It wouldn't advance. Uh -uh, it still won't advance. Oh, no. It's it's still someone. Oh, there it goes. Great. Thank thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not one of my strong points, technology. <laughs> okay, so now that we got the slide moved forward here, um, I'd like to re review with you the two core indicators for Henrico. As of this past Monday, Henrico County continues to be at the highest risk level for the number of new cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days. The number of new cases continuing to climb and hitting new highs. At the same time, Henrico County was at the moderate risk level for the percent positivity over the last four, 14 days. From Monday to Tuesday, this metric increased from 6.3% 6 to 6.8%. And from Tuesday to yesterday, this metric increased to 7.2%. And as you can see here, we have um, the earlier 6.3 um, posted here. As a reminder, the self-assessment at the health committee meeting determined um, Henrico being at the lowest risk level for a third core indicator. Before we look at the data for Chesterfield and Hanover counties and Richmond City, I will provide a quick visual showing the thresholds for the two core indicators and consider the current status for Henrico. The risk levels here for Henrico from Monday, December 7th are circled here in red. And as I said, air cases per 100,000 are exceeding that 200 um, case per 100,000, air percent positivity, and our mitigating interventions continue to work well in our schools. Here are the risk levels for Chesterfield from Monday, December 7th. The total number of new cases per 100,000 persons for the last 14 days is slightly less than Henrico, but the percent of um, positivity test um, during the last 14 days is significantly greater. As of yesterday, their percent positivity was up to 9.4. These are the risk levels for Hanover as of Monday, December the 7th. Both the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons for the last 14 days and the percent positivity uh, during the last 14 days are significantly higher than Henrico. Yesterday in Hanover, the percent positivity hit 10%, putting them in the highest risk category for both core indicators. And these are our risk levels for Richmond City, Richmond City from Monday, December 7th. The total number of new cases per 100,000 over the last 14 days, uh, sitting at 346 and a percent positivity during that last 14 day period at 3.9, which is less than Henrico. However, their percent positivity has climbed to 4.7 as of yesterday. The increase in new cases seen within the central region over the past few weeks has continued to keep the region at a level of high burden and substantial transmission. The trend is now increasing with an average composite trend score um, of 18.4. I will now have Dr. Teigen share our last few slides with you. As we transition into spring break, uh, spring break, I wish we were in spring, that's wishful thinking. Um, but as we transition into winter break, please know that the Henrico County Public Schools Health Committee will continue to monitor the CDC school metrics. The superintendent continues to be briefed after each meeting and advised of any recommendations related to student or staff safety. And at this point, Ms. Gilbert and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have related to the work of the health committee or the health metrics. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tigan, um, for your all's presentation. Uh, I'll start to my right, Ms. Kinsella, do you have any questions for Ms. Gilbert or for Dr. Tigan? No, I don't have any questions at this time. I just appreciate this update. It's, it's alarming how, how the numbers just continue to increase, especially after the holiday. Thank yes, you. 
Mrs. Ogburn. I have no question. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kinsella. I'm sorry, Mrs. Shea. I apologize. I know we're all wearing masks mm. to Hoover, <laughs> but um, I don't have many comments. I just want to thank you for pointing out that uh, two of our schools, since they affect um, constituents in my district, um, will it uh, will have slightly lower distancing. But those families who would be affected by that, so everyone knows, they have been contacted individually and have had that opportunity to change intent for their yes, ma'am. So. Um, any, anyone who's listening who's wondering if it's their school or not, if they haven't been contacted, it, it's not impacting their school, correct? Correct. Thank you. All right, that's all. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you, Ms. Shea. Mrs. Atkins. No questions at this time. Thank you so thank much. You. Again, we thank you for your dedication and your diligence and helping to keep us safe. So thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Thank you so much, Dr. Tykin. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Kesher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The next item is related to our 2018 to 2025 strategic plan. Dr. Tiffany Hinton's coming forward to provide some proposed updates to that strategic plan. Dr. Hinton. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. The division strategic plan was first approved in May of 2018. The plan was developed with a wide range of community input from across the county. Annually, we review our plan in light of the progress we've made on our key performance metrics and to ensure alignment with our current priorities. Since our progress update in August, our division leadership team members have worked closely with their departments to review the implementation drivers and the key performance metrics of the plan and we reconvened our st steering committee to share work group updates and suggested plan revisions. The strategic plan steering committee met virtually in October and includes representation from students, parents, business partners, staff, and two school board members. Specifically, thank you, Ms. Kinsella and Ms. Shea for your work on that committee. During the October meeting, the division leadership team members facilitated breakout discussions to report progress to date on the implementation drivers, to share proposed plan updates and additional key performance metrics based on the internal committee work, and to gather feedback on proposed plan updates and input on additional drivers and metrics that were needed. In reviewing the committee's feedback, we found some common themes across our breakout groups. Generally, the committee and department leaders advised that the plan be updated to reduce redundancy of similar implementation drivers that were incorporated under various goals, to narrow the focus specifically in regards to implementation drivers aimed toward academic achievement and instruction, to apply an equity lens throughout the plan, to update the implementation drivers to help drive our progress and remove those that have been completed, and to realign the key performance metrics across the goals. Taking this feedback, I'd like to highlight a few of the proposed updates more specifically. In order to streamline our work of teaching and learning, we are proposing to combine strategic goals one, two, and eight into one goal of Henrico County Public Schools will achieve academic excellence by transforming teaching and learning to provide engaging learner-centered experiences for all students. By combining these goals, all of the implementation drivers focused on instruction, the student learning experience, and academic improvement are organized together and we could reduce some redundancy. We also added an equity focus to each goal of equity, fairness, diversity, inclusivity, and or opportunity. These four focus areas have already been the lens through which we operate, but now we are explicitly aligning these areas of focus throughout each goal. We also combined overlapping implementation drivers. So for example, in multiple goals, there were drivers related to our academic and career planning process. These drivers have been moved under goal one related to academic excellence 
and combined into one more comprehensive driver. Many of the implementation drivers of the plan have already been completed and work is underway. Therefore, for ease of communication, we removed drivers that have been completed. So for example, you'll see a driver related to um, our climate surveys, and that's been underway for several years now. So we removed those drivers from the plan. These drivers, however, will be highlighted in our community communications so that the broader community is aware of our progress. We also added drivers to support our goal progress that had not been previously included. So for example, we added a driver to implement the leadership tracking system to support the development and hiring of our school administrators. This driver reflects our collaborative partnership with the Wallace Foundation and other school divisions to recruit and retain high quality educators. Lastly, we're proposing the inclusion of additional key performance metrics to align with the other proposed changes. For example, while we reported out on out-of-school suspensions in August, the committee felt that in-school suspensions should also be included as an equity index. So at this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Jinks to share more about our communication plan. A strategic plan serves tremendous purpose for shaping the goals and expected outcomes for the school division and confidence and trust in the plan are developed through relationships and regular communication to our internal and external audiences. Following today's update, you'll see the new content make its way to the main HCPS website. Once ready, attention will be drawn to this through staff and community email messages. The December 15th issue of our e-newsletter, also a media release and social media communication. On that front, the Strategic Plan Committee gave us several constructive ideas for bringing such a weighty document to life in ways that our audiences would find appealing and engaging. For example, brief videos produced over time that feature our teachers and students can show how certain aspects of the Strategic Plan relate to the school experience. Colorful, swipeable social media posts can serve up bite-sized pieces of the plan a week at a time or even a day at a time. When communicated on a scheduled and sustained basis, those bite-sized pieces accumulate and can often be less overwhelming than asking our audiences to read everything all at once. We'll look to communicate progress updates at predictable intervals of time, such as on a quarterly basis so that updates are expected and perhaps even anticipated by our audiences. And we'll support school principals with message templates for sharing this information as well, as our employees and student households may be more inclined to see that the strategic plan relates to their day-to-day -day school experiences in Henrico County Public Schools. And with that, I will turn it back over to Tiffany. So looking towards next steps in the process, the proposed plan revisions will be posted on our Henrico County Public Schools website and shared with our steering committee for review and additional feedback. A public hearing will be held at 530 in the Newbridge Learning Center Auditorium on January 14th to gather public input on the plan revisions and staff will be seeking approval from the school board on January 28th. And at this time, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinton. Um, Ms. Atkins? No questions at this time. Ms. Shea. Uh, Dr. Hinton, thank you for the opportunity for Ms. Kinsella and I to participate. Uh, I guess it was a little over a month ago. Um, I think she and I both left being really invigorated on being able to be part of this work and you know work that we really truly love digging into um, things with the school system. I wholeheartedly support these changes to reduce redundancies. I think when we went through our work that day, we found a lot of overlap, which means that those things are truly important and they fit in a lot of places, but sometimes with that redundancy comes some inefficiencies and in trying to figure out what really is a measure of how well we're doing. And so I'm really excited to see um, it a little more concise and a little more cleaned up so that we can um, really make sure we're making progress on um, those things that repeated themselves, meaning that they're, they truly are important to the, the core of who we are. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you so much, Ms. Ogburn. Um, just to 
next question. Um, well, actually, not a question, but a thank you to Ms. Kinsella and Ms. Shea for serving on the um, on the committee. But I'm just really glad to see the equity focus be part of of each section. And to me, the most important part about that being opportunity, because that's a, a, a thing I am passionate about. Is that you know, no matter where you live. Or your economic status or condition that opportunities are available to our students across the division, which should be our goal. So I appreciate y'all uh, taking a new look at that and putting that equity focus in. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kinsella. Yes. Um, Having sat on the uh, steering committee since 2018, I'm just pleased how it's truly transformed and evolved. Um, and I agree with Ms. Ogburn as to the equity lens, but I also want to thank um, Mr. Jenks and his communications team because the student members that participated um, gave us a, a, quite a bit of feedback about um, how they wanted to hear about the strategic plan, what it meant to them, how it related to them, and, um, and how we try to meet our goals and outcomes related to, to students. And uh, Mr. Jenks and his team have been uh, very responsive in terms of listening to student voice. Um, and that's something I know uh, my colleagues and Dr. Cashwell, and uh, we all prioritize listening to student voice. So I just wanted to bring that forward and just say, you know, thank you for incorporating this in the plan is how, to, how can we better reach not only our, our families and grownups and teachers, but our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, also to our presenters, and would echo that same thanks to all who have been involved in putting this uh, strategic plan work together as it's evolved over time certainly uh, is a reflection of some heavy lifting on the part of each and every uh, department uh, within the central uh, team. So I want to thank everyone for their collective work um, in helping us uh, keep on track with our goals as we work to attain them on behalf of the students of HCPS. All right, for the next um, several items, I'll be seeking your approval of policy revisions that have already been before the board and then uh, provide an opportunity to review some potential revisions on others. So for the first item, I'm recommending that the school board approve the proposed revisions to policy P6-01, school authority. Is a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-01, school authority. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second by, by Mrs. Kinsella. By Mrs. Kinsella, all through the roll call. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Bogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy is approved. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board approve the proposed revisions to policy P6-02-006 released time. Is there a motion to approve revision to policy P6-02-006 released time? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Um, Shea. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Atkins. Uh, roll call Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, recommending the school board approve the proposed revisions to policy P6-06-005 recovery of damages. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-06-005 recovery of damages? So moved. It moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogren. Aye. Ms. Shea and I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, seeking your approval of proposed revisions to policy P6-08-005, family legal guardian involvement. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-08-005? Dash 005 family legal guardian involvement. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Um, Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, recommending approval 
uh, for the revisions to policy P6-12-006 student publications. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-12-006 student publications? So moved. Been moved by um, Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. A roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, recommending approval of proposed revisions to policy P6-17-002 scholarships. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-17-002 scholarships? Moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Oh, um, did we just do disciplinary records? Or we did scholarships. Okay. Making yes, sure. I've lost track of my check marks All right. there. <laughs> All right. Next, seeking your appro approval of revisions to policy P6. 18-004 disciplinary records. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-18-004 disciplinary records? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogren. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, seeking your approval of proposed revisions to policy P6-18-005, maintenance of files housed in school buildings. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-18-005, maintenance of files housed in school building? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Um, Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next, seeking your approval of proposed revisions to policy P6-19-022, homebound students. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-19-022, homebound students? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Seeking your approval of proposed revisions to policy P10-08-003 long range planning. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P10-08-003 dash zero zero three long range planning. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Uh, roll call vote Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Next seeking your approval of proposed revisions to policy P10-08-004 facilities. Is there a motion to have it? Yes, ma'am. If I may ask a question, when we reference planning office, we, we do mean the school's planning office, correct? Because it's these are Henrico schools policies, Cor therefore the generic planning office does mean school. I just for a point of clarity. Thank you for that. I'm sorry I'm echoing. Yes, okay. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Um, to approve proposed revisions to policy P10-08-004 facilities. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Uh, roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you. Seeking your approval of revisions to policy P11-10-002 volunteer program. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P11-10-002 volunteer program? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Uh, roll call vote Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy has been approved. 
Thank you. Next, I'm seeking um, your approval and a waiver of the 30-day review period for policy P6-06-009, Management of Student Behaviors, Restraint and Seclusion. Uh, this policy revision is driven by a legislative change that will be effective January 1, 2021. All right. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Is there a motion to approve proposed revisions to policy P6-06-009, Management of student, student Behaviors, Restraint, and Seclusion? Inclusive in the motion is the waiver of the 30-day review period. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ogburn. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. And I vote aye to eyes. Have it. The policy has been approved. Thank you for your action on those policies. And we'll uh, take a breath before I move on to take questions about several that are being reviewed. And again, thank Mrs. Gimple, our policy committee, and all of those who have um, undertaken the tremendous uh, lift, as you can tell by the number of policies presented at each of our meetings, to make sure that our policies are consistent with practice as well as reflective of um, best practice and policy. So I'd also like to thank our board members, Mrs. Kinsella and Mrs. Ogburn, who serve on that policy committee for their work on this effort. So next, I um, want to offer an opportunity for board members to answer any questions or to ask any questions they may have. Should we be able to provide clarification on some policies that are just being presented for your review? Uh, the first one is a recommended revision to the policy P6-02-007, early dismissal. These are minor word changes made for consistency and clarity. Are there any questions? Board members, have any questions or comments on this policy? Dr. Cashwell. All right. Next, um, offering an opportunity to, to um, take any questions you might have on the policy related to proposed revisions for P6-09-018, protection from sex offenders. This has also been updated to align with practice and update wording for consistency and clarity. Board members, are there any questions or comments on this policy? Madam Superintendent. Uh, next, uh, offer an opportunity to discuss policy P6-12-009 uh, and proposed revisions to that one, which is performance and community activities. Again, minor changes for consistency have been made. Board members, are there any questions or comments on this policy? Dr. Cashwell. Okay, next. Uh, have presented for your review uh, revisions to policy P11-08-001, school visitors to align with current practice. Minor changes have been made for consistency. Board members, are there any questions or comments on this policy? Cashwell. All right, uh, that finishes uh, the information related to policy. Next, I'm recommending that the school board accept the Praxis Assistant Grant Award of $9,000 from the Virginia Department of Education. Is there a motion to accept the Praxis, Praxis Assistance Grant Award of $9,000 from the Virginia Department of Education? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea, roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to eyes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Next, I am seeking your acceptance of the STEM Early Learning Through the Arts Grant Award of $70,000 from the Virginia Department of Education. Is there a motion to accept the STEM Early Learning Through the Arts Grant Award of $70,000 from the Virginia Department of Education? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. There, second. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins, aye. Ms. Kinsella, aye. Ms. Ogburn, aye. Ms. Shea, aye. and I vote aye to eyes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Next, seeking your acceptance of the National School Lunch Equipment Assistance Grant Award of $14,670 from the Virginia Department of Education to benefit uh, Fair Oaks and Montrose Elementary cafeterias. Is there a motion to accept the National School Lunch Equipment Assistance Grant Award of $14,670 from the Virginia Department of Education? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to eyes. Have it. The grant has been accepted. 
Thank you. Next, recommending that the school board accept the grant funding from Share Our Strength and the Virginia No Kid Hungry campaign in the amount of $15,000. Is there a motion to accept the grant funding from Share Our Strength and the Virginia No Kid Hungry campaign in the amount of $15,000? Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The grant funding has been accepted. Thank you. Next, asking that the board accept the special education interpreter training grant increase of $2,000 from the Virginia Department of Education. Is there a motion to accept the special education interpreter training grant increase of $2,000 from the Virginia Department of Education? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ashe. A roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The grant increase has been accepted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the next item, it is that time of year where we will be taking a look at the HCPS planning guide, and I'll be seeking the board's approval on some revisions to that guide so that it's up to date. And before seeking approval, I'd like to provide an overview presentation of our guide and the efforts therein, and Dr. Hughes is going to kick off that presentation. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. My name is Leslie Hughes and I'm the Chief Learning Officer for Henrico County Public Schools. With me this afternoon is Liz Parker, Director of School Counseling Programs, Student Support and Wellness. Together we will present an overview of the fully digital 2021-2022 HCPS Planning Guide for the Board's approval. Earlier this afternoon, Dr. Hinton provided the Board with a presentation on the Strategic Plan proposed updates. As shown on the slide, academic and career planning continues to be an implementation driver for achieving academic excellence. In addition, careful and thoughtful academic and career planning will assist students with the skills and attributes necessary to be life ready as outlined in the Henrico Learner Profile. Before we move on, we would like to thank the many departments, teams, and stakeholder groups that met reviewed information, and provided input over a period of months in order to develop the planning guide proposed this afternoon. And now I will turn the remainder of the presentation over to Liz Parker, who will introduce the fully digital planning guide and highlight formatting and content revisions, which we will ask the board to approve. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. As stated, this year marked the final transformation of the HCPS Planning Guide from a 128-page document to a fully digital resource. With accessibility and equity considerations at the forefront of this year's revisions, the fully digital HCPS Planning Guide provides all students and families with a navigation system for their academic and career planning journey. We are pleased to share a short video highlighting the features and functions of the newly formatted planning guide, which are also detailed in the first two pages of the executive summary provided. This video is hosted by two of our very own students from the Center for Communications and Media Relations at Verina High School, sophomore Lisey Simmons and junior Lexi Church. Pardon our technical difficulties. If we're unable to view it, I believe you have the link to the video in its entirety and we can um, push on in absence of being able to view a clip of that. It, it won't um, move forward again. Fro I believe we have a frozen presentation <laughs> again, so pardon us while we work to unfreeze our uh, presentation. My apologies for the technical mm -hmm. challenge. It's similar to what happened before, it looks like. Yeah. Here we go. Now. I don't know what I'm doing today. I'm sorry. 
Where is that coming from? No. That is odd. Yeah. Looks like the video will begin. Yes, here we go. Welcome to the Henrico County Public Schools Planning Guide, an online program that gives students and families everything they need to plot their academic future. But it's more than just picking classes. This program shows how the educational choices made today connect with your goals for the future. It's just one more way that HEPS is empowering learners to be life ready. From the home page, students can navigate directly to a desired section by selecting one of the quick tabs at the top. Or you can click on the Start Here button to walk through a simple three-step process for academic and course planning. For example, a rising sixth grade student or any student who is unfamiliar with the planning process may want to select Start Here. That brings them to step number one, select a career cluster and path. Here, students are introduced to Virginia's career clusters and can explore any of the 17 career clusters individually. From here, students can move directly to step number two, choose a diploma. To help students find the Virginia diploma requirements that pertain to them, they simply need to identify when they enter or will be entering the ninth grade. If this was during or will be after the 2018-2019 school year, click here. If they enter the ninth grade before the 2018 to 2019 school year, students should select this option. This will display the graduation requirements needed for the Advanced Studies Diploma, as well as the Standard Diploma. Specific requirements for each subject area are included through a drop-down function. Now that students have explored potential career clusters and selected a diploma type, they will continue on to step number three follow your path. Here students can explore the variety of courses offered through your high school, the Henrico Specialty Centers, non-traditional programs, and regional high school programs that relate directly to their diploma choice and career paths. Remember, at any time, students and families can navigate directly to course descriptions by choosing the quick tab at the top. Here, the courses are broken down into two different categories, middle school courses, and high school courses. That way, even younger students can locate course options quickly and easily. A new function of the digital planning guide is the ability to view the entire list of all course offerings across content areas. You can simply click on the course name. This opens up a full course description that can be saved or printed. The planning guide enhances the collaboration between students, families, teachers, administrators, case managers, school counselors, and other staff. The goal is to work together to ensure students have a successful secondary school experience while focusing on and preparing for their life-ready destination. In addition to the reformatted digital layout and updated design, a number of updates were also made to the content of the planning guide. I will now highlight these content updates, which are outlined in greater detail in the executive summary provided beginning on page three. As you can see, the diploma requirements were reorganized from seven individual sections, each with its own qualifier, to two main sections based on whether a student entered ninth grade before the 2018-2019 school year or during or after the 2018-2019 school year. This was done to clearly guide students and families directly to the diploma requirement options that apply to them. This reorganization is also fully aligned with the diploma requirements included in the Virginia Department of Education Standards of Accreditation. Additionally, a footnote was added to clarify that AP Computer Science A is the specific computer science course that may be considered a mathematics, CTE, or standard science credit to satisfy graduation requirements in accordance with the standards of accreditation. Furthermore, a definition of student selected test was added to further clarify this requirement for students and families. And as a result of a very recent release by the Virginia Department of Education, we have made one additional revision that is not yet in your executive summary under additional graduation requirements for students who entered ninth grade in 2018-2019 school year and thereafter. 
For both the advanced studies and the standard diploma, this section was recently expanded to include successful completion of a dual enrollment course or a VDOE-defined work-based learning experience to the existing requirement of successful completion of an AP, IB, or honors course or a CTE industry credential. This was a welcomed revision that we were able to update in real time, which is another benefit of the fully digital HCPS planning guide. We are happy to provide an updated executive summary due to this very recent change. General information content was also updated. These revisions are outlined in detail in pages four through 15 of the executive summary, but a highlight is as follows. Language was revised in regards to adding and dropping a high school course to further clarify the process and timeline, ensuring compliance with the standards of accreditation when awarding standard units of credit. The section previously known as college credit was expanded and now includes all aspects of earning college credit while in high school in one place. Language was updated to clearly identify and define all opportunities for students to experience college level studies while in high school, including advanced placement, international baccalaureate, dual enrollment, and concurrent college enrollment. We also updated language regarding cumulative grade point average, or GPA, and class rank to accurately reflect policy revisions, and the explanation of diploma seals was updated to align with the VDOE. Because dual enrollment is now included in the section for earning college credits while in high school, it was removed as its own standalone section. Additionally, we added a bullet to the gifted and advanced learner section applicable to grades six through eight to include the international baccalaureate middle years program and added language to the fifth bullet in the same section to further clarify the process of applying to the gifted young scholars academy at Wilder Middle School. Language was also updated in the language instruction education program section to align proficiency level with WIDA assessment revisions and provide flexibility based on student need. Likewise, a slight modification was made to the locally awarded verified credit section to further clarify students with disabilities opportunities to earn unlimited LAVCs as credit accommodations. Also in general information, we clarified the ranking process of the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School, revised the description of school counseling to align with national models and VDOE standards of accreditation, modified the title of sequential electives to accurately reflect that sequential electives are now required for both the standard and advanced study diploma for students who entered ninth grade in 2018, 2019 and beyond. We also further defined sequential electives to clarify courses to fulfill this requirement. A new section, standard credits and verified credits, was added to clearly define both units of credit for graduation. Additionally, the section defining and identifying the standards of learning, end of course tests, and substitute assessments for high school credit bearing courses was updated to reflect 2017 revisions to the standards of accreditation. Furthermore, all of the standards of learning end of course test information was reorganized into a table format by course to simplify content and increase readability. And a link was provided to take users directly to the VDOE site for real-time information regarding substitute assessments for SOL tests. Finally, the explanation of summer programs was rearranged for ease of reading, and the testing program section was modified to differentiate between College Board's standardized tests provided to HCPS students per grade level. Outside of the general information section, content that was once included only under the career and technical education section in the previous planning guide, such as information about Virginia's 17 career clusters, is now embedded throughout the planning guide and identified through the quick tab navigation, as this information directly applies to all HCPS students. Additionally, a new tool was added to assist students in identifying over 100 CTE courses offered in Henrico County that may directly relate to the Virginia Career Cluster of Interest. Content revisions were also made to a number of specialty center and program areas, and these begin on page 16 of the executive summary. 
a number of course titles in the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program were updated to align with VDOE titles. Two additional course descriptions, Design and Innovation for Grades 6 through 8 and Web Design and Multimedia Graphic Design for Grade 6 were included to provide flexibility in meeting IB requirements to teach design and visual arts as a subject group. Additionally, all course descriptions for the CTE Advanced Career Education or ACE centers were revised to reflect curriculum updates, industry credentialing opportunities, and additional dual enrollment opportunities available. The high tech program description was updated to reflect current admission requirements. Furthermore, all dual enrollment courses with VCU included in the sample four year curriculum plan for the high tech academy were updated to identify the specific college credits students will receive to assist in confirming credit transferability. Revisions to the Center for the Arts included notations surrounding health and physical education requirements to align with the VDOE standards of accreditation. And the Center for Engineering section included a course title update to also align with standards of accreditation. Finally, the International Baccalaureate Program description for grades nine and 10 was updated to reflect current admissions criteria and a number of mathematics course descriptions were revised to provide consistency across this content area. This concludes the overall updates and revisions. We will now move on to specific updates to course offerings and descriptions at both middle and high school. As noted in our video, the fully digital planning guide provides students and families with an opportunity to view a list of all courses offered in middle school at one time. The same is true for all courses offered for high school credit. A full course description is available by clicking on the specific course title and can be saved or printed to individualize the planning guide for every student. This revision provided us with the opportunity to examine each course description in detail and recommend a number of important content updates. Pages 20 to 23 of the executive summary outline revisions to over 40 different middle school course descriptions across content areas, which are included on this slide, made to reflect curriculum updates in alignment with the VDOE standards of learning. Additionally, six social studies and two CTE course titles were updated to clarify course content and maintain alignment with VDOE course titles. In the area of fine arts, the course description for Marching Band Middle School was added to reflect current opportunities for eighth grade students who meet criteria to pursue Marching Band as a high school credit bearing course. And in the business and technology information area of CTE, the course description for principles and business marketing was added to reflect current opportunities for students to pursue this high school credit bearing course in middle school. Finally, in the area of world languages, introduction to languages and cultures was removed as a result of this curriculum being integrated into exploratory languages and culture six and French exploratory and foundations of Latin part A and B were removed as a result of low to no enrollment over three or more consecutive years. Students interested in taking French or Latin in middle school may continue to have the opportunity to do so through French one and Latin one. That concludes all recommended middle school course revisions and we will now move on to our recommended revisions to high school courses. Pages 23 to 29 of the executive summary outlines revisions to over 77 different high school course descriptions across content areas, which are included on this slide, made to reflect curriculum updates in alignment with the VDOE standards of learning. Additionally, two English language arts and one math course title was updated to clarify course content and maintain alignment with VDOE course titles. In the area of English language arts and social studies, the course description for American humanities was added to reflect a cross curricular learning opportunity that integrates American literature or 11th grade English with Virginia US history and results in both a standard unit of credit in English and in social studies. Additionally, in the technology education area of CTE, the course description for engineering and computer science, a unique version of the AP computer science principles that applies the foundations of computer science through the engineering lens was added to reflect current course offerings after a successful course pilot year. We included prerequisites to, to specific CTE and world language courses to clarify required foundational coursework for student success.
We also removed the course description for math fundamentals in the area of math and vocational emphasis two in the area of exceptional education as a result of content from both of these courses being integrated throughout other coursework in those subject areas. Finally, we removed the course description for college and career readiness math from the area of math as well as a result of no enrollment over three consecutive years. And because this curriculum content is now infused throughout all math courses pursued to meet the math requirement of the Virginia Diploma. This brings us to the end of all recommended high school course revisions. And to ensure that students and families are able to connect directly with HCPS staff quickly and easily, contact information was updated for all educational specialists, specialty center and program directors and administrators, middle school and high school principals and buildings, and central office administrative staff. This concludes all recommended content revisions to the HCPS planning guide for the 2021-2022 school year. We'll now turn our attention to some important next steps. As you know, the planning guide is just one initiative to support students as they begin identifying and selecting courses that will help them meet their academic and career goals. Here are some important dates for additional initiatives that will assist in preparing for the HCPS course request window, which is set to open February 15th and run through February 25th for all students who will be going into the sixth through 12th grades in the 2021-2022 school year. And looking further to the future, as a result of a collaboration between School Counseling Services, CTE, and the Department of Family Engagement, HCPS is excited to bring major clarity to students and families for an anticipated full implementation in the fall of 2021-22 school year. Major Clarity is a student-driven web-based platform that allows students to align their interests, abilities, educational pursuits, and career goals to ensure that they are prepared for a successful post-secondary transition. Furthermore, the Major Clarity platform engages students in grades four through 12 to assist us in providing a seamless vertical academic and career planning process from elementary through high school graduation. We look forward to providing additional details about Major Clarity and HCPS academic and career planning endeavors in the future. Finally, it's important to note that academic and career planning goes beyond course guides and websites to inform stakeholders of what is available for students. Staff in the Division of Learning is currently collaborating with other divisions to ensure course offerings are fair and equitable across the division. Rigorous instruction is afforded to all students. Processes for entry into specialty centers are fair and equitable, and that curriculum is viable and supports academic and career awareness, exploration, and discovery for all students in elementary through high school. At this time, Dr. Hughes and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that exhaustive presentation. <laughs> and, and I don't say that you know negatively connoted. I'm saying that it's very informative, it's very detail-oriented, and I really appreciate that. I'm sure my peers feel the same way. So thank, thank you, you, and for all the stakeholders, and uh, Dr. Tigen as well. I'm going to start to my right with uh, Ms. Kinsella. I, I just want to say thank you. I agree with Reverend Cooper. Um, wow. It, it seems that it's it's more accessible, mm -hmm. easier to understand uh, and navigate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what an endeavor. Um, it all, really, I just want to comment and say, I can't wait to go through it with three kids in the secondary. I can't wait to go through this with my children. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Ms. Ogburn. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, it is fabulous. I am so impressed. And Having, knowing that for so many years we have printed all those paper copies of, and what a cost savings to us, I know this has taken a tremendous amount of staff time, but um, being able to update this as needed, as courses change, things we offer, I just think it's so flexible. Uh, kudos to, to the staff for getting it done and uh, getting this off the ground. It's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, Ms. Shea. Yeah, I, thank you. I will echo the sentiments of my colleagues. I think this is uh, incredible that it's now virtual and interactive. I know it was a heavy lift on staff and it was necessi necessitated by this, these times, but I think it's um, really going to be a huge benefit to our families and to our teachers. You know, mm -hmm. I remember as a teacher, we would have 
department meetings and, you know, draw all the maps out on where so-and-so can go to, you know, so-and-so and the chart on how courses flow and what options are. And I know our teachers spend a significant amount of time really pouring over each student and making sure they're getting to the right place. And having this as a more interactive and collaborative process to families, I think it's going to benefit our um, both our, our, our students and kind of our classroom cultures um, tremendously. So I'm really excited about that. It is very confusing to try to navigate and figure these things out. Um, and so I'm really um, excited to see um, how this will help um, our families navigate. I do have a couple of questions. Um, has, um, let me just start with course descriptions. So I was excited to see that um, we took off some of the courses that have not been offered. I know with our, our paper copy sometime, uh, courses mm -hmm. would uh, just sit there that hadn't been offered for, for years. Um, are those co courses, are they eliminated or are they put in some sort of repository so they could be resurrected without going through the pilot program again? Correct, they're placed in a kind of a repository. So they are um, no longer part of our current course offerings for the next school year. However, they could easily be brought back in if student demand shows interest. Fantastic, and then I know uh, Ms. Atkins and I have participated in some discussions with students um, from different parts of the county wondering, you know, why are some courses offered some places and not others? And so hopefully this will provide, I think more access just to see mm -hmm. what the options are. And if our students feel like there's a gap at their school that they would like offered, they can have that conversation with their principal or their department chair. Um, and now with our virtual learning platform, looking at ways to possibly access across, um, across schools. Um, was there any discussion in maybe looping in some of our late elementary families um, as they're trying to make that math decision so that they can understand how that, and because that math decision can have significant impacts um, as they move through middle school and high school on what's available. Correct, that is an excellent note. Um, and fortunately with major clarity, we started start hitting students in that third grade and fourth grade year so we can definitely have those conversations when they're needed to be had. Um, right now, our current process is that we do, our middle schools do go to our elementary schools and we do start speaking with students um, in fifth grade specific to course planning, but I will absolutely take that note and that is definitely something we want to address. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I think now that it's digital, if we could just have maybe a, an elementary flow, a flow chart for elementary school parents that could see and then they could you sure. know, do all the clicking. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, I wanted to put a plug in, if you don't mind briefly, um, when I saw our um, career clusters. And um, I love how it connects to our courses because career clusters aren't just about CTE, right? right. It's about um, growing our students' passions through their coursework. But um, our CTE department is currently hosting these Life Ready Expos that go along with all of our career career clusters, and they're for any student, mm -hmm. uh, seventh through 12th grade. And um, they had one this week, they had energy a couple weeks ago that I sat in on, and it is not just programs that go straight from um, high school into employment. There's also two-year programs, four-year programs. It is a fantastic opportunity for any of our middle school and high school students to have real conversations with people in the industry about um, you know, what, you know, what employment looks like, but also what courses they need to like grow their understanding. And so now that we have this interwoven with the, um, the planning guide, I, it's just such an amazing opportunity for our students to participate in these um, Life Ready Expos that are virtual and they can just sign on and have discussions um, in, the, in the areas um, that they're interested in with people who are in that um, industry or college departments as well. Um, so thanks for letting me put in that <laughs> plug. Uh, one more question. Um, when y'all looked at class rank, I saw that there was some change in the wording around class rank. Um, was there any, I get um, this question, not super often, but it continues to bubble up. Was there any discussion on um, reevaluating how we do class rank, either in terms of pulling out the specialty center from mm -hmm. the larger um, high school class rank and or moving away from a numerical rank system to more of a Latin honor system? 
And, and I'm going to take sure. that question, if you don't mind, Mrs. Shea. Uh, the <laughs> changes that were made to this guide really just were to reflect current practice. And so in no way does it a change to practice um, on that front. But to your point, uh, we have heard from stakeholders, uh, certainly during my time in Henrica, that this is something that they're uh, maybe interested in reexamining. We've heard some from our secondary administrative team, as well as from our parent and student community. So certainly we'll be uh, interested in the potential of examining um, how we do uh, how we do those uh, ranks now and if there is an opportunity to make any change to that in the future and would welcome any input from the board as we consider uh, what, what might be next there thank you so much um, and that that most of all um, wraps up my thoughts um, last one just kind of general about career planning I appreciate that the career clusters are in there um, and also that students can see, you know, I love growing our passions of our students and where they're headed next. I always want to make sure that our students are never are kind of pigeonholed into one path. Um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, when I was in middle school or even the beginning of high school. I always knew I wanted to teach from being, you know, a, a young elementary schooler, but I didn't know I wanted to teach physics until I took <laughs> physics, you know, and that's when, you know, my passion really came alive. And so hopefully being able to see all of this so beautifully laid out, they can see how it's easy for some passions to mold into others and um, weave their way through to really create the best educational experience for themselves. So thank you for y'all's work. I know it was a tremendous lift. Mrs. Atkins. So first and foremost, shout out to the Communication Center at Verina High School. <laughs> Woo -woo! Uh, very, very proud um, of the Communication Center, the students and staff that help uh, put that video together and the communications team, Andy and his team as well. Um, Dr. Hughes and your staff, everyone that was involved, this is great work. I know uh, I have sat up here several times and talked about looking at some other colleges and how do we connect the dots. And this is one step forward in how we connect those dots and learning about all of our opportunities mm -hmm. are going to help families, not just families with kids now, but families that are planning uh, to have children or be more engaged in school systems. And so now we have an opportunity uh, to be exposed to all that Henrico County has to offer. And we can start conversations, families can start conversations much, much sooner because now they have exposure to what we have to offer and how it's aligned as they chart a career path forward for their children, not just when they get to high school and not mm -hmm. when they get to middle school and not perhaps even elementary. It's all about planning and starting with the conversation with facts and data and coupled with where do we want to go as a family and where do we want our children to be? So this is extraordinary work that's going to benefit families with children and families without children as well. <laughs> Thank so you. it really will. Um, I did have a few questions for the information that's on our digital platform related to VDOE. Mm -hmm. Are we entering this information or on the back end is there code so that it automatically updates the site? So on the site, we've actually just embedded the link. So anytime that the link's clicked on, it would pull from the real-time VDOE website. And that's just specific to that one section. Okay. And is that the cluster section? No, that well, the cluster section as well. So those links okay. are embedded and direct as well. And then um, we've also included different platforms um, like Virginia Career Wizard and Virginia Career View um, that link directly to those sites as well. That's smart work. Um, I know there was a time where we had to type a lot of things in, but to have it on the back end coded mm -hmm. so that it's automatically updated is huge. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge for staff too, so very smart work. Uh, one question around communication. I know uh, I saw the date for when it actually launches. Is there a plan to get some hype and excitement around this, this guide? I think half the battle is doing it, which was a tremendous effort. The other piece is making sure that communities are aware of it, not just in the beginning, but continuously making sure that it's there. Is there a plan for that yet? This might be a question that's too premature, but is there a plan for that? No, we've definitely discussed and talked about that. That's the exciting part, right? That mm -hmm. we get to then share this great thing and um, invite and communicate that to, to our families. So it's definitely something we've talked about. We're embedding different pieces of communication into our overall course planning and scheduling timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it's all pieced in through that timeline. Okay, 
fantastic. So whenever that's ready, um, I'd love to see that actually before it's published. Okay. Uh, I think this is something so tremendous, exciting, and needed uh, that I, I'm hopeful that we do something large and big for it. And then lastly, as we talk about some of the courses that, that are going to be in that guide, how do we get more input from students as to their interest level? I think once we begin exposing this and mm -hmm. families see all these different things, we might have another opportunity to assess the interest in the courses. So as Mrs. Shea kind of uh, shared a little bit, with courses that are taken away, we're putting them in a repository, which is phenomenal and great. We're not getting rid of them. But I also think that we may start begin getting more questions around our programs and it also lends an opportunity to ask students and families what are some of the career interests that are listed in this resource. So um, just something to consider mm -hmm. to start measuring interest would be great. And as we assess what feedback we receive, it could help guide us to explore more or take away as well. So all of that is to say I'm really excited about this. This is great work, and I think we're going to see this expand even more in different ways. So thank you. Thank you. A uh, quick question, kind of expounding on um, the dialogue that you had with uh, Ms. Atkins. What are your plans in communicating this to uh, families who don't necessarily have the technical experience or um, may feel overwhelmed by the extent of the content on this platform. Kind of talk to me about that. Yeah, it's absolutely, that's a great question. So like I said, a lot of the rollout for this year um, really involves those personal interactions between school counselors and the students on their caseload. So there are a lot of individual um, conversations that will be happening and this actually allows us to walk students through the planning guide together and then also personalize it to their interests by printing out um, specific sections that that student might be interested in, printing out those specific course descriptions and really providing them with almost a hard copy packet that they can then hold on to. So while it's digital, um, we also created it so that it could be easily saved, emailed or printed um, at the building level by our school counseling departments when they're having this crucial conversations either through small groups or when they go into the classrooms or when they're meeting individually with students and families. Well, I appreciate that because it, you know, having information is wonderful, but not being able to access it right. and understand it and apply it, mm -hmm. that, that causes a bigger disconnect. And so, you know, I appreciate the, uh, the intense and the intentional effort in regards to um, equity and opportunity, you know, because it's important our kids have exposures as well, right? So some people don't know that there's certain professions out there because they've never been exposed to it. So the impact of major clarity is, is a great, I guess, parallel to mm -hmm. the planning guide. And I'm really excited about that because I think that's another tool, right? Mm -hmm. It's web-based. But again, you know, if, if I can't access it, if I don't right. understand it, if I can't apply it, then it's not beneficial to me. So please, as you deal with your staff and all the mm -hmm. stakeholders, that we're very conscious and we're very cognizant of the fact that we need to make it applicable and accessible and understandable so that our students and even families, because sometimes people may not tell you that they don't understand or they right. don't, you know, comprehend. And I don't want that to be a um, impediment, if you will, for our students and families to be able to um, use this and maximize it for mm -hmm. um, their, their learning and career opportunities. So that's just kind of, if you could, I know you will, I'm sure, Absolutely. but that's, that's important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, again, um, thank you so much, Ms. Parker, uh, Ms. Hughes. Um, we appreciate you all's work. Um, as Ms. Shea stated, it is definitely a heavy lift, a Herculean task. Look forward to the evolution of this yes. in application. Madam Superintendent. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. members of the board for your feedback and questions. And again, to um, Dr. Hughes and Mrs. Parker and all who were involved in this, as has been pointed out, it was a, a huge effort, not just in this um, transformation to the digital. So some may recall this is a multi-year effort where we were taking every facet of our academic and career planning, not just the course guide, but anything from college exploration with virtual reality to all of these pieces that thread together that help um, our students on that trajectory to being life ready. So that was certainly part of the effort here with the course guide, but also just the fine tooth comb that was used to go through every <laughs> aspect and get it up to date. That's certainly appreciated and it was uh, long overdue. So thank you very much to all who thank were involved you. in this effort. 
For our next presentation, uh, we will be receiving an update, and Mr. DeSalt's going to kick us off on Henrico County Public Schools' participation in the Maggie Walker Governor's School, which, of course, is a regional uh, program and um, draws students from any number of school divisions, including Henrico. So uh, Mr. DeSalt will, uh, is prepared to provide us an update of our participation in the program. Madam Superintendent, can I interject for a moment? Oh, most certainly. Before we proceed, can we go ahead and um, um, take a motion oh, to see we if we- Oh, we didn't take action on that course guide. Uh, yeah, if, you, if, you didn't want, if you don't want to do that, oh, we can- We are so ready. I apologize. I was um, sucked into the robust and wonderful discussion about all that it means for our students and forgot that key piece. So I am seeking the board's approval of the changes you heard about to the 2021-2022 planning guide. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent. Uh, is there a motion to approve the changes to the 2021-2022 planning guide? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second, Ms. Kinsella? Second. <laughs> it's been moved by Mrs. Shea and seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. Madam Superintendent, the ayes have it. The planning guide has been approved. Many thanks, and again, my apology for missing that key step. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Harris, for pointing that out. Uh, next, uh, we will have that Maggie Walker update. Again, this is the regional school um, of which Henrico County is a participant. So Mr. DeSalt is going to provide us an update on our participation, and I see we're getting slides underway. So uh, we will get that up and running momentarily. Thank you for your patience. Chairman Cooper, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, my name is Mike Dusalt. I'm the Director of Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. I'm here today with Ms. Jenna Conley, Henrico's gifted specialist, to give you all our Henrico County Public Schools participation update for the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. While many of you may have some institutional knowledge of Maggie L. Walker Governor's School, our goal today is to provide you an overview of where we've been with regards to this unique learning environment in Henrico and where we need to go to ensure we are providing opportunity to the broadest range of students. To truly understand where Henrico and Maggie L. Walker Governor School intersect, we felt it was important to reflect upon the past to focus on the future. Magdalena Walker was a renowned Richmond figure who was the first African-American woman to charter a bank and serve as its president. She was, a she was dedicated to civic engagement in the Richmond community. Maggie L. Walker challenged racial discrimination and gender bias at a time in history where others feared to tread. The Maggie L. Walker Governor's School was established in 1991. It is one of 19 academic year governor schools in Virginia and only one of five governor schools housed in its own facility in the city of Richmond. This regional program is known for its emphasis on government and international studies and draws students from 12 school divisions, including Henrico. Maggie Walker provides a rigorous college preparatory experience for high achieving students and is ranked nationally as one of the top public schools in the country. Maggie Walker's mission shares they will develop lifelong learners who embrace the responsibility of citizenship, the value of ethical leadership, and the richness of diverse cultures. Henrico County Public Schools currently offers 180 slots to students to participate in the Maggie Walker program. Each year qualified, students have the opportunity to apply for the various spots available. One essential question our families need to consider before the application process begins is, who is the ideal student for Maggie Walker? Well, to give the board and our school community some background on who is the ideal student for Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. Let's hear it directly from Dr. Bob Lowry, the director at Maggie Walker. Hi, my name is Bob Lowry and I'm the director here at Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. 
I'm often asked about what makes what an ideal, ideal Walker candidate. And I think that the answer goes way beyond just what you would see on paper. What we're looking for are intellectually curious kids who have a need to challenge themselves and aren't satisfied with just learning what's being given to them. We're looking for kids that are innovative, that are imaginative, and that really want to learn and will push the envelope, both with our teachers as well as the curriculum, to find the things that engage them. What we also do at Maggie Walker is create courses that are based on student interest as opposed to the other way around. While grades are certainly important, working hard and accepting challenges, to me, is the best measure of how a student will be successful here. Hi, my name is Bob. So good, said it twice. <laughs> there are two main components to the Maggie Walker admissions process. First, we will look at the application process of eligible students. Next, we will move into the selection process of students based on the specific criteria. Let's first take a look at the current Maggie Walker established application eligibility criteria, which is based on rigorous academic programming and international studies focus. We'll then outline the process for the selection of students. Maggie Walker outlines that our eighth grade applicants must have completed or be enrolled in Algebra I or higher level math course, high school credit courses when they apply. Secondly, applicants must have a B average in each of the four content areas for the seventh grade school year. And third, Maggie Walker highly recommends that students who apply should have one year of an international language. Henrico County Public Schools includes this as a requirement based on the Maggie Walker recommendation. Henrico eighth graders who meet the three criteria for admissions become part of the applicant group eligible to apply for Maggie Walker admissions. Gifted programs in collaboration with DARE generates a report of all the students who meet the application criteria and are then contacted through our school messenger. Gifted programs meets with all middle school counselors prior to the applications being available to review the process and timeline, as well as to provide detailed directions on how to monitor the application submissions. Initial communications to families through School Messenger includes a text, phone call, and an email, which includes all of the relevant documents needed for the process, including a specialized FAQ document timeline, directions, and technical assistance for the online application, as well as a video guide amongst the other materials. These same documents are housed on the HCPS, Governor's School website. Middle school counselors receive a detailed spreadsheet that indicates if any families from their school did not receive the school messenger notification. Henrico hosts multiple evening informational sessions for families to review all the materials and ask questions about the application and selection process. In addition to contact from their school counselors, the Henrico Gifted Department sends subsequent school messenger notifications to remind eligible students and their families of the approaching deadlines and continues to provide relevant documents and any updates along the way. Once Henrico students have submitted their applications to Maggie Walker, Governor's School, and completed all the components of the admissions process, the HCPS selection process begins. Complete student applications then enter an Henrico-based scoring system that helps determine who will fill the vacant slots that year. The scoring system you see here was representative of the 2019, 2020, and previous school years. This year's 2020 21 scoring system is based on the breakdown shown on this slide. Now, as you can see, applicants will require composite scores that include two teacher recommendations, grades, GPA, and rigor points for the middle school coursework. A written essay is typically given, but we are unsure at this time and are waiting further clarification from Maggie Walker. Additional standardized testing will be waived for the 2020-21 school year admission process due to COVID. 
Once we get clarification on point values from Maggie Walker, we will be able to update the Henrico community. Students are then selected based on composite ranking in two phase process. Phase one of the selection process, Henrico applicants are ranked by composite score and the top scoring candidate from each middle school is selected. There are 12 slots for phase one, one for each middle school. In phase two, applicants are selected in rank order from their overall list. 26 students were selected in phase two last year. Homeschool, private school, and all other student applications are selected in rank order to fill the remaining slots. The number of slots varies based on the number of Henrico seniors who graduate from Maggie Walker in any given school year. Now let's take a moment to walk through the past few years of data with an intentional focus on equity and demographics. We will unpack specifically who is eligible, who is actually applying, and who is ultimately selected. As we begin to lay out the Maggie L. Walker application and admissions process, we wanted to start with specific data and metrics to help paint the picture of the past, present, and ultimately where we need to go in the future. This is a snapshot of our HCPS demographics from the fall of 2020. This graph shows the reporting category demographics of Henrico students attending Maggie Walker. As you can see with this graph, Henrico, like many of our surrounding districts, has a disproportionate number of students attending Maggie Walker when comparing the data to our district enrollment demographics. Equal representation at Maggie Walker Governor School has been discussed for many years, and in 2020, a Maggie Walker subcommittee revisited a University of Virginia study completed over 10 years ago. This study yielded a report created by leaders in the field of gifted education. This team studied the recruitment, identification, and retention of students from underrepresented populations at Maggie Walker Governor School. This team of four conducted surveys, interviews, analysis, and compiled their findings, which were presented to the regional board in June of 2009. This report highlighted commendations, issues, and recommendations. However, significant change has yet to be realized at Maggie Walker and their demographics, and thus subcommittee once again brought these same findings to light to all partner districts earlier this spring. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Ms. Jenna Conley, our gifted specialist, who will continue our dive into the data. Good afternoon, board. Now that we've gone ahead and outlined the application process. Let's review Henrico's demographic trends on who has been eligible to apply over the last three years based on the criteria we reviewed previously. School year 2018-2019 demographics are displayed in blue. School year 2019-2020 demographics are in red and school year 2020-21 are displayed in yellow. Our applicant pool typically ranges from 1,200 to 1,300 or more students based on the number that meet the application eligibility requirements. On the positive side, most demographic subgroups have trended upward over the past three years as the number of students eligible to apply has increased. When examining the demographic data of those who are applying in Henrico, we're continuing to see an increase in students actually committing to apply. School year 2018 and 2019 data and school year 2019-2020 data are displayed here. There were 432 applicants in school year 2018-2019. In school year 2019-2020, there were 528 applicants. This graph shows the 2018-2019 school year eligible versus applied student applicant numbers, so you can view them side by side. 
Blue bars represent eligible students. Red bars represent applied student numbers by demographics. Altogether, 1,310 students were eligible to apply. 432 students applied. Here we have the 2019-2020 eligible versus applied student numbers. Blue bars represent invited students. Red bars represent applied student numbers by race. It's important to note, once again, the number of eligible versus applied. 1,274 students were eligible to apply. 528 students applied to Maggie L. Walker Governor's School last year. This graph shows the demographic breakdown and numbers of students selected over the past two years by Henrico County Public Schools. The numbers are reflective of the phase one zone selection model, which was added in 2009 to ensure students from each middle school and each magisterial district were offered spots to Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. In school year 2018-2019, 432 students applied, 53 were selected. In school year 2019-2020, 528 students applied, 38 were selected. The graph highlights the very low number of black students selected for Maggie L. Walker Governor's School, as well as selected American Indian, Alaskan Native, and Hispanic students. Less than 10 is used here to ensure confidentiality. Maggie Walker's strategic plan includes goals to co-develop a plan with its partner districts to increase enrollment of historically underserved populations and to foster an inclusive environment that provides a sense of belonging and supports student and family engagement. To that end, Maggie Walker continues to work toward the recruitment and retention of diverse students. Additionally, for the 2020-2021 school year, admissions testing was waived in light of COVID. While this change was approved for this school year only, there's been much discussion about the role of testing in the student selection process and whether it is the best indicator of a student's success at Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. That dialogue and greater community conversation is ongoing. The Maggie L. Walker Governor's School strategic plan also includes initiatives to develop and enhance its relationships with partner division schools, staff, parents, and potential students through outreach programs, mentoring, and community service. Equity and opportunity are pillars of Henrico's 2018-2025 strategic plan. Early and consistent communication to our Henrico County Public School students and families about the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School Program is a growth opportunity for Henrico County Public Schools. Henrico's much larger growth opportunity is to decrease, to increase the diversity of selected Henrico County Public School students for the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School Program. To address these growth opportunities, we would like to share some next steps and future considerations. Maggie L. Walker Governor's School is a unique and rigorous program that offers Henrico students the opportunity to experience a regional learning environment focused on international studies. Henrico's role within this regional partnership is to broaden our community's awareness of the program, support the growth and success of this program, and monitor the demographic data that will drive our shared goals. To that end, here are some proposed actions and future considerations. These are our proposed actions regarding the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School 2021-2022 school year application process. The planning stage and application review would take place this year during school year 2020-2021. To ensure that the application process is accessible and user-friendly, we propose to review applicant feedback annually and to refine and improve the online application process. The application should also be available in multiple languages with supports in place to assist students and families. Focus group interviews should be conducted to seek user feedback and suggestions. Focus group interviews of students who choose not to apply should also take place to better understand reasons behind those decisions. In order to provide consistent communication within Henrico County Public Schools, we will work with specialty center directors to provide more detailed pathway information to students and families. 
We hope to give our elementary and middle school families the coursework planning guidance they need as students progress toward their bridge years, from fifth grade to sixth grade, and from eighth grade to ninth grades. We want all families to have the information they need to make informed choices regarding our advanced academic achievement and specialty center programs. In addition, we would like to ensure that Henrico County Public School students and families have access and opportunity to advanced achievement programs such as Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. We are committed to improving our application process. To broaden our applicant pool, we are considering the discontinuation of the Henrico County Public School required world language course as a criterion to applying to Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. Exploration and use of resources such as Virtual Virginia could help support the acquisition of a world language for those meeting other application requirements. Additionally, we would like to increase our translation services and in-person support meetings to ensure that our multilingual families have access to and awareness of the Maggie L. Walker Governor School application process. We also hope that by hosting general application support workshops, we can further assist students in navigating the Maggie L. Walker Governor School application. We're also seeking ways to provide additional outreach to our elementary and middle school students and families to ensure that Henrico County Public School coursework pathways required for advanced programs are transparent and that students are familiar with program requirements well in advance of application year grade levels. A final consideration to improve the larger Henrico County Public School application system for all high school specialty centers, as well as Maggie L. Walker Governor School, is to streamline and simplify our multiple application processes into a common app available online through a single platform. These future considerations promote a broadened applicant pool with the Henrico County Public School provided supports to navigate the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School application process. As the Maggie L. Walker application process has progressed this fall, the Gifted Programs Office has increased our efforts to reach our applicant pool through multiple media via the Henrico County Public School communications platforms. Our online application process and school messenger communications have streamlined and improved family access to Maggie L. Walker Governor's School information and materials, but additional support is always our goal. One future opportunity should include application workshops for students and families in addition to the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School info nights we host each year. These workshops could be strategically offered at middle schools with lower numbers of applicants and students and families that need assistance with the application process. Other considerations include working with Maggie L. Walker Governor School to conduct a detailed review of the point value system used in the selection process to ensure a balanced approach. Standardized testing has previously comprised 35% of a student's composite score. This year will be a pilot for restructuring the weight of the remaining composite score components. Another selection consideration for the future would be for Henrico to add fiscal support for additional seats at Henrico County Public School students to attend Maggie Walker. And finally, as we mentioned earlier, the Maggie L. Walker Governor School Subcommittee proposed a revised selection process to all feeder districts which choose applicants according to composite score and home middle school in a zoned model approach. Oh, excuse me. Divisions with multiple middle schools evenly divide available slots by the number of middle schools and invite students based upon home middle school from the school level list by composite score ranking. Henrico County Public Schools may elect to set a threshold score to ensure that sufficient evidence exists to confidently predict students' success at Maggie L. Walker Governor's School. In a secondary step, the remaining slots are filled using a division level list of candidates ranked by composite score. Henrico would use appropriate school level or division level waiting list to make additional offers if students decline invitations. We hope these future considerations will continue district dialogue and actions that will broaden our applicant pool and increase the diversity of shared Maggie L. Walker Governor School and Henrico County Public School students. 
As you can see on our final slide, the 2020-2021 Maggie L. Walker Governor School timeline is well underway. Here are some of the upcoming dates to make note of, as well as Henrico's Maggie L. Walker Governor School site and the Maggie L. Walker Governor School website. Each provides in-depth information and details about the admissions and application process. You've heard a lot about the who's of Maggie L. Walker Governor School and Henrico County Public School students. Who is eligible to apply? Who does apply? Who is selected? And who is the ideal student for Maggie Walker Governor School? You've also seen graph, graphs about who makes up Henrico and who makes up the Maggie L. Walker Governor School program. Those discrepancies are at the heart of our proposed Henrico County Public School next steps as we consider how to ensure that our Henrico County Public School demographics are represented in the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School demographics. Excellence and equity are achievable with additional application supports and improved communication and application plan, growth goals and targeted effort. Our proposed actions for the 2021-2022 application process are intended to grow Henrico's diversity in the Maggie L. Walker Governor School Program and ensure we are extending this opportunity to the broadest range of students. At this time, Mr. Dusalt and I will now take any questions or comments on our presentation. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Conley, and again, Mr. Dusalt, for your presentation. Um, we have the privilege in Henrico of having the uh, chairwoman of the Governor School's Board as our school board member, Ms. Ogburn. So I'm going to start with her. Ms. Ogburn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, I've been on the Maggie uh, Walker board for over six years now, and it's, um, it, it is a, quite a joy to, to be the Henrico representative. Um, just a couple of things. Um, Dr. Capsule and I both have had the opportunity to uh, meet with some of our Maggie Walker students um, the, what, about a year and a half or so ago, we had lunch with them, with some of the students, and the overwhelming feedback um, that I remember and took away so much was that the students said when they initially applied, they felt like Maggie Walker was out of their reach, that this was, you know, I'll apply, but it probably won't happen. And one thing I would hope that as part of our what can we do and in our next steps, that we would start earlier in our introduction of our specialty centers and Maggie Walker with our students. You know, by the time they get to eighth grade, those courses have already been taken. And so if we start in fourth or fifth grade, telling kids what they need in order to be successful in specialty centers and Maggie Walker opens up that door to them that they might not have otherwise thought of. So I, I would like for us to have that as a component. Um, you know, because like I said, the students told us they didn't think when they applied, they, they thought it was a long shot. And they didn't think, but there we were talking to them at, at Maggie Walker. And so it's an accessibility um, problem that we have, I think, because the kids just don't think that they can get in. Um, they also don't understand exactly what it is that Maggie Walker does. This is feedback we've also given to the staff and the director so that they can just update their outreach and as they go around having information centers, really um, make kids understand what Maggie Walker is all about. Um, but what we're talking about at Maggie Walker is you know, updating our application requests and our criteria. But um, that, like you said earlier, Jenna, is a work in, in progress. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to ask is, have you thought about, because at Maggie Walker, we're talking about this, the possibility of having a portfolio type approach to the application process where kids could have let's say five or six things to choose from where they brought forth their, um, their best effort to represent themselves in the way that they choose. And we have five or six possibilities and they are required to pick three or four. And it's not necessarily, you know, a one size fits all application. 
if you know what I mean. It's, for example, it could be, you know, transcripts and recommendations and things like that. But a number of the kids who go to Maggie Walker are very gifted in other ways. And if they have the ability to show that, it might give them that opportunity they were otherwise missing. Have y'all thought about that? There has been some conversation about, you know, in lieu of testing, you know, what other kinds of components might we consider as part of that composite score. And that has certainly been touched upon, Ms. Ogburn. I think that your idea that a more holistic approach that might be portfolio-based, maybe there's an interview component in future, is definitely something that we would want to consider and something that we will certainly discuss because I think that you're correct in that, you know, so many of our students may have talents that, you know, we're not necessarily seeing it's you know it's something that we need to bring out and having a portfolio approach where we see you know ad additional pieces of sample work from students and their excitement about you know their their special kinds of talents and things that they do in and outside of school too I think would be very telling um, and I think that that is certainly something that Maggie Walker will want to consider especially if the the waived testing if that leads to you know some some change down the line they will definitely be looking to boost um, the components considered. Right. Well, and I think it's really important to note that we had, you know, over a thousand students eligible. I don't, I think it was like closer to 1,500. But anyway, we are turning away right around 500 students a year that have the ability to apply, they um, didn't get in. And when you only have over the, four, over the span of a four-year um, enrollment, you have roughly 40 to 45 kids in each grade. Um, there are counties who send more students, Chesterfield and Richmond City send more students than in Rico. So what I kind of like to do is lay the groundwork with my colleagues of adding slots to uh, Maggie Walker. We, um, as Jenna as, and Mike, as you and I, um, changed emails this week um, just to get the numbers right. So we, the tuition is about eight, is right at eight now, $8,400 a year. So for example, adding 12 more slots, one more slot per middle school would cost us $100,800. In the budget the size of our school system, that's, you know, an acceptable um, number. I think it's not a, a too big an ask. It, so, for example, even if we did that over the course of several years, we did three a year, or we added six in one year, six in another, something like that. I, I think, like I said earlier, to me, one of the things I really value is opportunity. And if we were to open up more slots at, at Maggie Walker, we're giving more opportunities for kids all across the county to, to, to be accepted. And when you're turning away 500 or more students a year, I, I think we need to look at that as a budget, um, as we go forth with the budget as a budget priority to be able to add more slots. Um, so I'd be interested to know what my colleagues think of that. Um, but anyway, other than that, I appreciate the, the information. I think it's really valuable for us to be part of this discussion. Um, it is ongoing, as you said, at Maggie Walker. and. Um, just being frank, I think changes are coming to the governor's schools across the state and to Thomas Jefferson in Fairfax. And the, the Fairfax board is weighing um, what to, um, how to make changes at Thomas Jefferson right now. They're in that process. So I, I would like for us to be in charge of our changes, what works for Henrico and what works at Maggie Walker, rather than having it, for example, dictated by the Department of Education. So I'm really glad we're weighing in on this and getting this work started. So I, I'm very appreciative, Jenna, uh, and for you and Mike to, to, to tackle this. It's not an easy task. And it is one that parents will have a lot to say about. So I'm glad we're you know, being proactive. So thank you for that. And if I might interject, uh, thank you, Mrs. Ogburn, for, for those notes and comments and questions. I think uh, one thing I'd want to point out as a point of clarification, uh, in case this isn't expressly clear to all who are following uh, the presentation and, and 
their involvement, our involvement with Maggie Walker, unlike Thomas Jefferson, which Mrs. Ogburn referred to in Fairfax County, which is a Fairfax County program, this is a regional school. And so what makes it unique when we're talking about the application process and criteria for admittance is there are Maggie Walker criteria, and then there's also a division level process. So I think, you know, understanding where those two things intersect was pointed out quite well in the presentation. And um, to Mrs. Ogburn's point, we've seen quite a bit of discussion at the Maggie Walker level uh, related to which criteria may or may not continue to be in play. And we've also reflected on our, our local process uh, for entrance and, and the number of seats and accessibility and opportunities. So I think what we're seeing is um, the intersection of two really important conversations. So certainly we could, uh, if we were solely making um, some of these changes at the local level, but there weren't necessarily some changes made at the Maggie Walker level, we might not see outcomes uh, that we're looking for when we think about equity, opportunity, and diversity when it comes to making sure that the students we're sending represent the Henrico demographic. And so what we know today is that when it comes to students applying and being accepted, we don't see that match in representation, and that's what we're aiming for. And so uh, I just thought it was important to point out that there are two pieces to this. So certainly there's some things we can do as Henrico County, but much of this is also dependent on changes that would be made at Maggie Walker Governor School related to their criteria. And we've already seen them suspend the mm -hmm. entrance test for this year year and have talks uh, in there in the works about not continuing that and instead doing something different. So lots to keep abreast of there. Well, and two factor cash flow, one of the things I think we have to consider is how do we meet the needs of our students? And, you know, what we're dealing with at Maggie Walker, um, I know um, Mr. Basalt said um, earlier it was 12, 12 uh, school districts, it's actually soon to be 14. There are two new school districts joining and sending students to uh, Maggie Walker. And they each have the ability to have their own application process. And um, unlike, like you said, you know, TJ in Fairfax is, is determined by the Fairfax School Board. And so we have the opportunity to to affect our students and how our students are accepted to Maggie Walker. Other districts, I'm sure, will look at what we do, and but they make the decisions for themselves. But you know, we have at Maggie Walker some school districts who send as few as two or three students, and we have you know quite a bit more for uh, for Henrico, Chesterfield, and, and Richmond. So it, it is. You know, it, what we do will be seen by others, but it does just affect our students. So I think it's really important that we find a way to add opportunity for our students all across the district. Um, so I, 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 I appreciate that clarification. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ogburn and Dr. Castro. Uh, Ms. Kinsella, I'll start with you. Yes, it, once again, thank you so much for that presentation. I know I learned a lot about Maggie Walker and, and the whole selection process and, and our process and in conjunction with their process. The theme, the theme for us continues to be, and I'm so pleased, you know, access and opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so I just appreciate this presentation and look forward to a more balanced um, demographic uh, that, that gets selected to have the opportunity that Maggie Walker offers that's more representative of our student population. Um, thank and you. I, and I hope I'm back in front of you all in you know, a year's time. And I, I want us to be able to affect that change that you all want. And I think you know, with some deliberate work and, and bringing some folks together to really think through how we can implement that change is so critical right now. So I look forward to that. Yes, thank you. Let me show you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, and uh, frankly, I'm sure you answered some of them uh, in your presentation, but um, they're still a little muddy, so I'm just going to ask just some specific okay. <laughs> clarity questions. So, do we choose which of our students go to Maggie Walker, or does Maggie Walker choose? So the selection um, process is owned by us. Um, we do use their their composite score is kind of a, a regionally 
you know, structured type of thing, but we have our students ranked. And then from there, you kind of heard about how um, many years ago, Henrico did go to, you know, having one student per each middle school in a, in a zone model kind of step to ensure that representation of, you know, students from a similar school setting and, and geography are getting representation at Maggie L. Walker. So um, we very much, you know, kind of, use those those numbers we have to select the students um, from there. So yes, it's Henrico that does that. Based on that criteria, however, that Maggie Walker does set forth for us. So um, it's very symbiotic, you know, and where one leaves off and one picks up, um, we're very much the selection um, part of that process. So we essentially, outside of those 12 for the middle schools, then take the next highest ranked that Maggie Walker ranked Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. that's correct. And in that second phase of selection, too, that's when our homeschool students and our private school students become part of um, the selected student composite rank as well. So our choice in that part is to have the 12, from, one from each middle school, and then we use kind of their rank from there. Yes, okay, exactly. That's really helpful. I was trying to figure out um, who was where. So how does our admissions process compare to the other districts that participate in Maggie Walker? Do we know? Um, our admissions is, is pretty static across the region. It's more the selection that might vary a little bit. Yeah, so um, I know that as part of this diversity subcommittee that we referenced in the presentation that um, it appears that Richmond and um, Chesterfield may be making some changes to their selection processes, but um, Everybody is, is really attempting to, you know, to look at this and, and consider the best way to select students equitably. And so they, to my knowledge, I, they were kind of mid-process from, from my understanding. Thank you. Um, how, in general, um, how do our students fare at Maggie Walker? The students we select, does it end up to be a good fit for them? Typically, yes. Uh, I just got an email with all their first um, quarter grades, and you know there might be you know a, two or three that you know you can see might be struggling somewhat. But in general, I would say very very high percentage are faring very well at Maggie L. Walker. Um, so that's a little more typical. But the, for our ones that may struggle a little bit, I will say that they do provide amazing support through their guidance department. I mean, they really go the extra mile to support our students. And sometimes too, you know, if it's a situation I need to get involved in or gifted programs, we really do try to work together, you know, to see what's going on before, um, you know, things, academic records start to suffer. And so mostly all good. Good, mm -hmm. well, I, th I think that's important as we look at selection processes for any of our programs to kind of look backwards as well and say, is our selection criteria lining up and selecting the students that it's a good fit for? And so I appreciate that insight. Um, are we considering, this might be a Dr. Cashwell question, but are we considering similar reviews of applications to our specialty process? I know they mentioned kind of a common app, if you will, um, but are we, are we considering um, similar changes? Yes, uh, as Mrs. Kinsella point out, I think pointed out the theme of equity and opportunities woven through a number of our strategic goals, uh, now very expressly through the way they've been written. And then, uh, yes, so there are implications for all of our programs and processes. And so uh, there is an examination as part of that high school redesign work to look at our programs and um, identify any barriers that might be existing uh, in relation to those programs. and and missed opportunities, so that may include a review of those application processes, as well as any uh, uh, criteria that may be needed uh, that could be looked at in a different way. Thank you, and then one last question, um, just because you're here, and I, um, I, I, I've been hearing it, I've been having a lot of conversations with families in my district about middle school IB programs. And a lot of those conversations then go to, well, if they're not at XYZ IB program, they're not gonna get into the governor's school. So uh, can you help me understand, do specific middle school programs and participation in those, do, do those factor in? Is that part of the weight of that rigor score or can students who are in their, their regular zoned 
uh, middle school that are taking rigorous classes there, c can they have the same kind of competitive value, if you will, to their application? They certainly can. And um, the way rigor is kind of calculated, I know a few of you all have gotten those questions lately from some of your constituents. Um, so long as they're taking the most advanced coursework, you know, for their seventh and eighth grade years, it doesn't really impact whether it's an IB course or not. They're still weighted the same way. So it doesn't impair anyone from having an equal opportunity um, to apply. I really appreciate that insight to put as a little tool in my toolbox when I'm having some of these conversations. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Atkins. So, you know, Maggie Walker was the daughter of a former slave. And she was this grand secretary uh, for this organization specifically um, focused on social and financial advancement of black people. And as you started your presentation, uh, which I love talking about her civic engagement, she was a teacher. Uh, she's just, uh, she was a phenomenal woman. And, you know, based on the data that you've shared, it's, it's certainly clear uh, that there are opportunities to improve diversity at Maggie Walker Governor School. And I understand it is extremely difficult to collectively um, address issues when they're in a bubble. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Ms. Conley, Mr. DeSalt, your whole staff. Um, you have been having some courageous conversations. You have been attentive to constituents who ask the question, how come my child can't get in? All these types of questions, particularly from black families. And um, I, I just want you to know um, that I'm grateful for that. I know that um, this, is, this is going to be some continued tough conversations, mm -hmm. but I have no doubt that you're gonna continue to pursue excellence in you know, the solutions that you've shared. I know more of them, um, but I really would like to see a presentation, a deeper level presentation on all of the things that you're doing, including the discussions. The discussions are critical that folks know that you are having them, and it is a perfect time to have them. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna say job well done, that we're not afraid to dive into that diversity conversation and, and move forward. Um, I did have a few questions. Um, around the teacher recommendation, something that I hear feedback on is that it's subjective. Uh, that sometimes you can have a teacher, you can have a student and a teacher just not jail. They just don't mesh well, but academically they're phenomenal. Hmm. And so because we know teacher recommendations can be subjective, um, are there any considerations on how to review and modify that process? One thing I will say about the teacher recommendations is I know Maggie Walker has had good conversations about the weight assigned to that particular component because you know, we want to ensure that um, students are getting you know, um, fair access with that composite rank. So we don't wanna ding them if, if in the event, like you say, you know, maybe they haven't had an opportunity with a teacher that's gonna give them you know, a, a glowing recommendation. But they're, they're weighted such that they're not going to hurt the student um, as heavily. Um, they're not narrative at all. They're strictly score-based. And so, you know, they did try to remove that from a, a previous version so that, you know, my personal feelings as a teacher aren't really reflected. It's a, you know, it's a number score that we're giving students to be more objective that way. I know we've talked about could we from gifted programs potentially in future provide almost like a training for teachers, or, you know, to do it, it's, it's hard to know which teachers are gonna be asked for recommendations, but it's typically, you know, your world language and your history teachers at the middle school levels for seventh and eighth grades. So we have had some conversation and discussion about, you know, outreach to teachers in terms of, you know, what the components are that they're scoring and how to, you know, to really think through that process because I don't really think we do much along those lines currently. Um, and we would like to really examine that a little more deeply, I think, and assist in that process. Thank you for that. I want to share an example with you of, of a family whose son had four different teachers in one school year. And when that particular family applied to be a part 
that teacher really couldn't provide the recommendation because she had only been his teacher for a month. Yeah. So, there, so I, I really want to make sure that teachers get um, adequate understanding. I'm not sure if training is the right word, mm -hmm. but just an understanding of culture, an mm -hmm. understanding of rigor, um, and that it can manifest in different ways. And so I think, you know, just maybe cultural literacy might be key in scenarios where you have schools with high teacher turnover. And it's unfair for the teacher as well, because now the teacher has to assess a student that she hasn't had the opportunity to build a relationship with. So just some things to think about as you're going through the process of trying to see if that process can change. Certainly, I think that's a great idea. And I know, especially like this year, it's been difficult. We have been hearing from some of our families that, you know, this teacher doesn't know my student as well, or, you know, what, what have you, things have happened where she, there's been a change in teacher, like you say. So definitely, certainly uh, something we can fix and, and be attuned to as we think about, you know, when we're working with classroom teachers on how to to approach this and to be sensitive to that if we need to waive things or if we need to have access to previous teachers a different kind of way, we would certainly make allowances. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's something else to think about um, when we're thinking about gifted programs. Um, oftentimes when uh, a student has a friend that's in the program, they start to talk about it and uh, you know, the communication is so much faster because when a friend sees a friend that's about to apply, then it spreads much faster. When you have a lower percentage like 3.9%, it makes it tougher to expand exposure through the child's conversation with their friends. So in thinking about that, um, it, there may be some opportunities to pair students together from different backgrounds and different cultures to talk about the program, maybe just some afternoon talks or something like that. I just wanted to share that idea with you. And I think then, that's a great idea. Uh, Mickey also asked for some feedback, and I want to get to that because I wrote it down to make sure that I stayed focused. I think um, Mrs. Ogburn, one of your um, responses was you wanted to understand better thoughts on expanding the program. I think that's the right thing to do. I think every child in Henrico County that want more rigorous, challenging education, and if they're able to do it, I think they should have the opportunity. And so if we're able to expand, I think we should. I would be on board with that. So I just wanted to make sure I responded to your question. Okay, thank you. I know um, I know we have a lot of interested folks, so. Mm -hmm. And then um, my last comment, I think we're running into a common theme as a public school system. Um, and that is partly because of our environment and being in the virtual world. But I, I'm going to repeat again when we think about communications. Um, so if we just use this timeline as an example that applications are available through PowerSchool, but what about the families that, that have trouble with internet and aren't able to do this application by the start time? Are there other ways that families can complete the application? That's, this is a two-parter. And even before they get the opportunity to complete the application, if the marketing is just digital, how do you become aware of it? That is a great question. Um, we use um, the online PowerSchool portal in order to make those online applications available to our Henrico families. Um, we do offer like a paper pencil kind of version to the students that come to us from home schools and other situations with, with private schools. Um, and it's gone from being, you know, a paper pencil version to this online process. Um, in, in order to provide, you know, some of the, the information systems and the data that we're collecting on students and to also work well with the platforms that Maggie Walker uses in, in the scoring pieces and transcripts and things like that. Um, if a student, you know, needed a, a paper version, there, you can access some of these materials online, but again, if, if the gap is, is technology, you know, if that's where we have a, a shortcoming, then that is something that we have to be aware of and make allowances for and, and provide whatever materials we can. Um, I know that if, if 
people reach out to us needing assistance, we are very responsive. Um, and But again, most of what we're doing, especially this year, has been very tech heavy. And so I do hear you about, you know, we need to make sure we're not missing out on people who are not accessing some of our our great technology that we have, you know, if, they, if that's a gap, then we can certainly look to to remedy that. I also think, um, you know, in thinking about uh, getting our, our students interested, um, we are reaching out to students, but the bigger piece is the reach to the families, the mom, the dad, the grandma, even the next door neighbor. And I think part of this gap is making sure that we pique the interest of the adults and of the entire community uh, because I can share with you in my community, I had someone, uh, a, a dad, um, and he's raising his son alone. And he asked me, what are my chances of getting into IB? And I said, well, your son is incredibly bright. Why don't you apply? Well, the response was, well, part of it is I live in a black hole, so I don't know when, I don't know where, and I work. And so, you know, I, again, the digital divide is a problem. And I, I'm giving you the example so that you just know it's a problem. But the other piece uh, Mrs. Ogburn hinted to is making sure that everybody feels included, mm -hmm. feeling like you have a chance, feeling like you have a voice. That narrative and perspective, I think, is the biggest battle. And part of it is when you look, and if, if you have a family watching right now and they see only 3.9%, a family may not want to put their child in that scenario knowing it's only 3.9%. The social emotional piece is feeling like you may not belong is a big piece. And so again, I, I just want to give you some examples, share some feedback, and then just tell you that I think that you and your staff are phenomenal because I really enjoy being in this spot and being with staff who's willing to have these courageous conversations and use data to do them, to have the conversations, and then being willing to listen. So job well done to you and your staff. And I'm looking forward to the solutions that you've shared. I'm looking forward, fingers crossed, that you're going to come back and share the deeper level of solutions because I know you have them. I've seen them. And I want everyone to be able to see them too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. DeSalt, Ms. Conley. Again, I appreciate your work. So, you know, I'm looking at your presentation and your slide that has HCPS growth opportunities. You have two bullet points that are identified, right? And so we know that the numbers drive um, the growth opportunities. So um, increasing diversity of selected students. So I guess my, my question is, are we using kind of a research-based um, intentional, comprehensive model to determine what our desired benchmarks are for an increase? Or are we just kind of speaking nebulously saying we just want to increase the number? Because I think if you just say we want to increase the number, but I would love to see what's the benchmark? What are we trying to increase the number to? What's the percentage we're trying to increase it to? Mm -hmm. Because I, I mean, just so it won't be just, hey, arbitrarily speaking, you know, we're excited because we got 10 more kids from, you know, a disproportionately affected, you know, uh, racial ethnic background. But I would love to know, are we doing that? How are we coming about that? That's the first question. I'll jump in on that one. That's a great question. You know, I think there's a couple of components to that. The first one is, you know, we're looking for systemic change. And like to your point, you know, one or two kids is not going to cut the mustard. Um, we know we've got to do things at an earlier level, whether it be the communication, whether it be the um, identification of students, looking for students, supporting teachers, training, all of that is great. But I also think we have to look at, you know, what's in front of us right now. And what's in front of us right now is we're still in that limbo spot of waiting for Maggie Walker to go ahead and make those first set of criteria and what it's going to look like. And then I think we can kind of gauge a little bit further. I think if we were just to kind of put numbers out there right now, I think that would be a little bit more difficult. But you're absolutely right. You know, what, what, is, the, what is the bar that we're trying to hit? What is the growth we want to see from year to year? And I think once we get a firm feeling from Maggie Walker of, look, these are going to be the, the criteria that we want, then we can continue to move forward with our plan. And as Ms. Atkins mentioned there, you know, this goes all the way down to the preschool, into first grade, all the way up through elementary. You know, what we're doing to prepare these kids so that when they get to middle school, they're on that track already. No, I, mean, I agree. I think it's, it's a parallel path in regards to our um, process of redesign right now. And, I, and right. I guess 
you have to understand, Simmons Ball for this my fifth year. You know, certain reports, I, it, they just, it kind of triggers me because of the disproportionality of the numbers, right? So when I see the discipline numbers, and each year, mm -hmm. you know, African-American males, students with disabilities, and it's, it's almost like it just, it's a barrage, it's a deluge, it just keeps piling on. And so you see these numbers, and this is the same thing, because it takes me back to the AP course enrollment, it takes me back to the AP course uh, uh, test, you know, and so, we just have to ensure that we're, we're, we're making sure that we have these benchmarks that we can specifically and definitively say, you know, once we've determined what we're looking for, we can set these benchmarks based upon the research and the comprehensive um, intentionality. You know, that being said, you know, I'm, I'm for Ms. At Ms. Uh, Ogburn's uh, statement about addition, right? But the problem with, I would have with it right now is, if you add more slots now and, it, and it's contingent upon our criteria and process now, you're gonna get the same results. The same exactly kids right. are gonna take up the same slots. So, you know, it's about how can we add the slots, but when we do add the slots, make sure that the processes are in place, you know, division-wide, that we're able to, you know, determine what the benchmarks are, determine how we're gonna get more diversity amongst our children. I mean, because if you look at the Asian population, just that number, mm -hmm. I, I don't have the exact number, I'm not gonna look at it, but it's like out of 280, 220 applied. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and that's just, that's, 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 that's incremental to the eligibility who applied. I think it's great. You know, if you look at the Caucasian kids, you might have 1,000 or 1,500 kids, more than like 300 plus. So again, disproportionately affected. So I just, across the board, but I just would love to, to kind of hear that. And the second question is, you know, Wilder and Fairfield are two of my schools, not including Ms. Kinsella School, which is uh, Moody, who have IB programs in the middle schools. So if we, if we just take and in, 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 in just isolate Wilder and Fairfield, how does Geisa at Wilder and IB at Fairfield impact the opportunity for the zone children to have an opportunity to get selected, you know, at for, for Maggie Walker, given that we've already identified middle school and high school, that we do not offer the same rigorous courses at all of our schools because of the uh, interest, because of, you know, all the factors that we talked about. But talk to me about how those two programs specifically, you know, with the backdrop of Moody as well, affect the zone kids that, that apply and are selected for the program. So that's one thing we're digging into right now. We have not historically had data on where the slots are taken in terms of their feeder patterns and where the students originally came from. So that is something we're working on currently. And we will be able to provide that to you um, if you would like. We're almost done with that report. So you can actually see where the clusters truly are. And that goes to your point of you know adding seats. Are we going to just see more of the same? So we want to be very intentional that if we are going to go ahead and move forward with, with additional seats, if you guys find that you know the will, that we want to make sure they're going to the, the folks that we're intending these seats to go to. Well, I'm excited, right? I mean, I'm excited from the perspective of we've identified areas of opportunity. We're, we're trying to be systematic and coming up with solution focused, you know, approaches. And I'd love to see where we go, right? If, if, it'd be different if we, we act like this doesn't exist, exactly. but we're saying we know it exists, right? But this is what we're going to do to mitigate you know, the current paradigm and shift it. So again, I, I'm coming from a perspective, thank you all for the, for, for the lift and just know that in myself, I'm sure my peers as well, you have partners, right? We want the best for all of our students, want opportunities, want equity, diversity, but we just need to make sure that our systems and, and, and practices are in place to help to facilitate that. So again, thanks for both of you, that's, that's my opinion. So. Absolutely, we appreciate the support. Yeah, and, and Chairman Coomer, Cooper, great point related to making sure we're very clear on what is the outcome we're driving for. And I think, you know, while we haven't identified specific year-to-year -year goals of our increasing our diversity, I think when you look at the slide that was showed early in the presentation and it shows the demographics of Henrico County, we will not have realized our goal until the students we're sending match that demographic representation. If we believe all students can achieve and deserve opportunities, then that's the change that we're ultimately looking for. But certainly a great point about making sure we're really clear on what our incremental goals are so that we can stay on track towards that uh, ultimate outcome we're looking for. All right, well, with no other questions from the board, thank you again to our presenters for your excellent work and we'll um, look forward to keeping the board abreast of this ever evolving uh, situation and, and our work uh, towards that goal. The next item is related to our proposed 
2021 to 2022 to fiscal year 2025 to 2026 capital improvement plan. You'll recall at the last board meeting, uh, staff provided the administration's proposal to the board for your consideration. And tonight we will, or this afternoon, we will be seeking your um, approval for our proposed uh, CIP. We did note, and we'll spend some time uh, providing an overview without rehashing all that we did last time. The board had some specific recommendations specifically related to Longan Elementary and some summary slides and how the pr and information's presented. We've made those changes according to the board's feedback at the last meeting and have those changes for your review and then would open up the floor to any questions and considerations you may uh, have before we formally seek your approval for the CIP. Mr. Pritchard. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. At our last meeting and after our 21-22 CIP presentation, this board made some recommendations to consider before our presentation to the Board of Supervisors. Before you vote on the CIP, I would like to highlight the changes made that reflect the recommendations. I'm just gonna get to that point. Don't realize how long this thing was until you get to this point. There we go. Um, the request was made to move the Long and Elementary School project from FY24 year three to FY23 year two of the CIP to potentially help with the capacity concerns in the River's Edge, Springfield Park, and Long and Corridor. This slide reflects that change as we made that move. And the other recommendations that were given were um, to provide some kind of summary of the, the, the projects that were listed, to summarize the CIP projects into categories. And we created three categories, a physical year 22 slide, and that was what put all of this in there with the actual, uh, the projects and the amount. The next was our potential bond projects for physical year 23 through 25. There again, um, that's a whopping number and an, uh, an extensive amount of projects that we will spread out, but it is very well detailed and done. And then last was the um, summary of the unfunded long-term projects, as you can see, um, that, would, that would need that part as well. And that would take us up to FY26, and then the longer range programs are the ones that would still have to go through the capital improvement study. So those recommendations were made and I just wanted to highlight those changes for you and I would be glad to answer any kind of questions that you do have. Thank you so much, Mr. Pritchard. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Ms. Moore, hello. Uh, Ms. Ogburn, you want to start us off? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, Mr. Pritchard, if you would move back to um, the slide that shows 23, this will be your 23. Oh, let's, yeah, well, wait a minute. I guess it's 24 then, sorry. Um, is that one there for you? Yes, that's great. Um, this is my issue. Um, we have on fiscal year 24, the West Area um, Elementary School Edition. And I know I'm a broken record on this, but I have a real capacity problem in, at River's Edge Elementary School. And um, I've talked to, to about this before, but you know, basically we had hoped when we started redistricting to be able to fix the issues at, at uh, River's Edge and the overcrowding there by redistricting. And the committee proved to us that that is not possible. They struggled with it, they, they couldn't do it. We are in the midst of redistricting and we're going to leave River's Edge Elementary School at 108% of capacity because there is nowhere to send them. So I think the only solution that's been proven is to build our way out of this problem. And so my request, and I, I um, am going to ask my colleagues to support this idea, is to move the West Area Elementary School Classroom Edition up one um, slide and put it in fiscal year 23. Um, because if we, even doing it then, it will be roughly four to five years before the um, before Springfield Park and, River, and River's Edge get any relief. And 
That is, they've already been waiting a number of years, and they and Riverside Edge are great at using every single bit of space in order to fit the kids in there. But the prediction is it is only going to get worse based on the development in the area. So what I would like to request is that we move that up a year, and um, so I'll let that flow around. But also, just a note of appreciation um, for including the Cane Road property. Um, that has been a question for years. I get asked on a regular basis what we're gonna do on Cane Road, if anything. And um, just as a little bit of information uh, for the public, what we've been looking at is possible in the future, at some point, six, 10 years, something like that, um, some sort of secondary school and an elementary school there that we will need for capacity reasons. And um, just, just knowing, knowing that, that that, that is on the horizon for way down the road. Down the road. So, so I appreciate, appreciate you putting that. that in the long range plan. But I'll just ask my colleagues what they think and hopefully we'll be able to move that up a year. And if that classroom can uh, addition can come sooner, I, we will all at River's Edge be very, very grateful. So um, just throw that out there. But thank you. Does that conclude your comments, Ms. Agmore? Yes, it does. Thank you. Until, until somebody else wants to talk about River's Edge and additions. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Atkins, I'll start with you this time. Um, Mrs. Ogburn, I guess the question is, in moving it up, um, will that impact um, the other uh, projects? And how will it impact the other projects? I could not hear Mrs. Atkins, so I didn't hear the question. So with, with that um, recommendation, will that yes. impact the other projects will that move other projects down how will that change impact the other I, projects that are scheduled right i would not think so i mean because when you look at this this is going to all be part of a bond referendum in the future and to me um this would put the addition along with long and and, and davis and the Virginia Randolph, I'm not suggesting that we bump another one for this one. Um, I'm just suggesting that, you know, we understand that in, in the past, we have always put a priority on capacity issues and capacity projects. And so I'm just asking that this go on the front end for capacity reasons. Um, and so, no, I'm not suggesting that we bump anybody else out or it go first or anything like that. I'm just hoping that we can put it up closer to to ensure that it is in that bond referendum if there is one. And just I want to make sure that um, thank you, Mrs. Ogburn. And so we want like staff to chime in on Mrs. Atkins' question as well. I think um, while Mrs. Ogburn indicated that it wasn't her intent in moving it um, up to year two to replace it with, uh, or I mean to move any of the other uh, projects, those would stay intact. Uh, Ms. Moore, do you have any concern that adding that addition to year two would in any way negatively impact the ability to complete the other projects that are listed? Should this timeline eventually be uh, funded? We know it's unfunded, so we're speaking in the hypothetical, but hypothetically speaking. No, ma'am. With the capital project team that we have, I feel comfortable that we would still be able to accomplish all of these projects. And just reference that we did do seven projects in 2017. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope that answered your question, Mrs. Atkins. It does. It does. And, and thank you as well, uh, Ms. Moore. So, Mrs. Ogburn, I don't have any issues with it at all. You know, hearing that there aren't going to be any negative impacts, um, I, I'm fine. Uh, anything else for me, Ms. Atkins? I'm done. Yes, ma'am. Ms. O'Shea. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ogburn, I can support moving it to year two. Um, and then I'll just reiterate for the record that my priorities are to um, this ACE Center um, for year one, both the expansion and renovation, keeping that on track. I think that will serve all of our students in all five of our districts and is um, much needed as we've talked about at um, many previous board meetings. Um, and then as well, um, keeping that Cuyacasin Middle School rebuild in our sights. And uh, um, although Jackson Davis isn't in my district, it's pretty close to my district and I'm looking forward to that rebuild as well. So 
So, but I can support moving Miss um, Ogburn's suggestion uh, of the addition to year two. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank you, Ms. Shea, Mrs. Kinsella. Yes, um, I guess I'll start out um, just once again celebrating page one and, and year one of our projects with our three ACE centers on there. It has been a long time coming, and once again, the theme of this meeting and many of our recent meetings is meeting the needs of all of our students. So I just had to say how excited I am about that. And then um, in, in response to, to Mrs. Ogburn, um, as someone whose district is, has been overcrowded, I understand your concerns because it, um, you cannot redistrict your way out of um, the situation. Um, Mr. Pritchard, do you or uh, Ms. Moore feel that the infrastructure at Springfield Park can support an addition as a board member who has experienced an elementary school that received an A-class addition and um, we had some adjustments to the and, and uh, an increase to the uh, size of the cafeteria, but really none of the other um, amenities, if you will. Um, can, can you opine on that yet or do we need to research it more? I mean, we, I know that we have looked at it through the eye test. It would still have to go before other people, more professional people to look at it um, for the infrastructure. I mean, with all of the gas lines and water lines and everything else that runs through it, the topography of the land and so forth, all of that would have to be inspected by other people more qualified than us. Okay. Um, I, I will tell you from the eye test, it, it, we feel confident that it can move forward, but we want, we want that recommendation from, from a certified professional before we can say this is gonna happen here. And then, and then while you're looking at that in an effort to support um, Mrs. Ogburn's recommendation, if you could look at, um, I think they only have one trailer there. I two. believe, is it two? Two, yes ma'am. Um, if, if you could, could see you know, how many would fit at River's Edge, if you will. If, if we have space, because it takes time to, even with the move in year two, let me be clear, even if this moves to year two, it's still gonna take time to build the addition um, once funded and designed. So I wanted to ask that question as well. And then do we, do we think that this would, I, I know this will help with capacity for River's Edge, do we feel like this is gonna, um, is, is the move that we made for long and into year, into the second year still as necessary, do you believe, Ms. Moore, Mr. Pritchard? Because I know we not only look at this as capacity, but it's also safety as to the study that we had done. I mean, these are recommended timelines um, for our projects. Um, do we feel that anything will change with Longin? Because I know we, we moved Longin to slide two. Um. I, th I think we would be fine. I mean, that, would, that total would give us a total of five projects in, in FY23 year two of that part. And, okay. and I think that as long as we are capable, and we have shown in the past, and, you, and like Ms. Moore said, in 2017, we completed seven, seven projects at one time. So I feel pretty confident that we could do that as well. I mean, any changes, we would definitely notify people immediately. Um, okay. And then since you say that we do have the, um, the wherewithal to be able to manage those projects, I mean, with uh, the Brooklyn has had 30, we have 35% of the trailers in Henrico County Public Schools. And I know once Holiday is built, we'll lose um, nine. nine trailers. Right? Nine, and, yes. And we'll still have 25, my district will still have 25% of the trailers in Henrico County Public Schools. Um, is it, it, since we're gonna talk about, um, we can't redistrict our way out of it, or I don't know, I just want to mention Hungry Creek, the addition, that the numbers didn't, don't currently, the enrollment numbers don't currently support um, a move, I don't believe, but I just want to go on the record saying that each time we look at the capital plan and next fall when we look at uh, enrollment numbers and uh, comprehensive redistricting, that uh, Hungry Creek will need to be 
discussed and potentially addressed as well as a as a uh, as more of a hot topic and priority. And then lastly, Mr. Pritchard, when I looked at um, the detailed CIP um, that we were provided, I was looking for a project that I didn't see um, that's part cosmetic and I believe part, um, a potential safety um, concern for us that I've received some advocacy about. It's at Johnson Elementary School and it's the parking lot. So mm -hmm. if it if at some point um, you could also look into that and potentially let get back to me and let me know um, mm -hmm. what your thoughts are, okay, as an well, add to as an add to future projects. Mm -hmm. We do have some parking work on the master project list, okay. uh, but Mr. Pritchard and I discussed um, some of those projects. And we have been kind of tracking that parking at Long, uh, excuse me, at Johnson. Um, Johnson. Uh, so what we will do is take a look at that master project, okay, uh, project on the list, and see what adjustments we need to make in order to possibly expand that parking lot, or if we have to actually go to a different green space in the site and add new parking area. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to put that forward since this is um, the CIP discussion. And then thank you so much for all the work you guys have done on this. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you so much, Ms. Kinsella. Um, Ms. Ogburn, I am in agreement with uh, your recommendation as well. Um, Ms. Moore, again, Mr. Pritchard, thank you for okay. your presentation and for your uh, additions and addendums. Thank you again, you again for the hard work. Uh, Madam Superintendent. All right, well, given the board's feedback then, I will be seeking your approval for the CIP for fiscal years 2021-2022 to fiscal year 2025-26, with the change being made to move the proposed West Area Elementary School six classroom addition from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 23. We will make that change and are seeking your approval on a version that uh, reflects that change. Uh, board members, is there a motion to approve the FY 2021 2022 to FY 2025 to 2026 capital improvement plan with the addendum. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Yeah. Act. Seconded by Mrs. Um, Ogburn. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mind, Ms. Shea, do you? You don't mind. Sure, it's fine. Yeah. All right, <laughs> one of you. All right, Ms. Ogburn, we heard you. <laughs> Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The CIP with the addendum is, has been approved. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased with the outcome we see in this uh, board approved CIP and we'll look forward to sharing that with our folks in county government, um, our manager and supervisors for their consideration. Thank you again, Mr. Pritchard, Mrs. Moore for your efforts. Mr. Sorensen, I know has been involved in the work as well, as well uh, as the board for your um, excellent feedback as you um, know your constituencies very well. Thank you very much for that. All right, the next item, I am seeking your approval for the Dominion Energy Utility easement between the County School Board of Henrico County, Virginia and uh, Dominion Energy, Virginia at Tucker High School. And this is, of course, related um, to the easement that's part of the replacement project there, seeking your approval. Is there a motion to approve the Dominion Energy Utility easement between the County School Board of Henrico County, Virginia and Dominion Energy, Virginia at Tucker High School? So Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The easement has been approved. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Finally, I have some consent items for you, which can be taken in, the, in a block. I am seeking your approval for acceptance of the monthly financial statement and budgetary status report for the month ending October 31, 2020 acceptance of the monthly financial statement for school nutrition services operation for the month ending October 31, 2020, the approval of personnel items, the approval of a new member to the Henrico Education Foundation. All right, is there a motion to approve the following consent items? Um, acceptance of the monthly financial statement and budgetary status report for the month ending October 31st, 2020. Acceptance of the monthly financial statement for school nutrition and services for the month ending October 31st, 2020. Approval of personnel items 
and approval of new member to the Henrico Education Foundation. So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Uh, roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Uh, Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The consent items have been approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the next item, I want to point out in front of us, you see some beautiful poinsettias. Those are gifts for the board from our Director of Workforce and Development and Technical Education, Mac Baton, as well as his team and the ACE Center students who are a part of growing these beautiful specimens. So happy holidays from their team. Please uh, take a poinsettia with you before you leave today's meeting. Just wanted to point that lovely holiday gift out and thank them as well for that. And would like to take a moment to recognize a member of our team, uh, sort of a bittersweet moment for us all. Mr. Chris Sorensen, our chief financial officer has announced his imminent retirement and that makes this his last meeting with us. So we could not end this meeting without taking a moment to acknowledge him and thank him for his tremendous uh, service to the school division as chief financial officer. He has a long career in education, not just here uh, with Henrico Schools, but uh, has positively impacted school divisions across Virginia. And so, uh, Chris, thank you for your service. Uh, truly a bittersweet moment. You know, in your career, you often get to work with people who are masters at their content or their role, uh, but not often people who are also tremendous individuals and human beings with a true passion and care for what they do. Chris's passion coupled with his uh, expertise uh, and care has made sure that Henrico County students have what they need to succeed. He's been masterful at helping us develop a financial strategy that has positively out, um, had outcomes for Henrico County Schools. So thank you for your service. You will be missed and happy retirement. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes items from me. Hey, all right. Um, well, I, I want to say personally, Chris, I had a, the pleasure and the privilege of serving with you um, on the Math Science Innovation Center Board. Um, even when we weren't the fiscal agents, you were on the Finance Committee. And so if I could just add a little bit to what Dr. Cashwell said in regards to your passion, I want to you know, thank you for your passion, your professionalism, your proficiency, um, but also your presence. Just, you know, some people have a way of having a calming presence. So you know, your professionalism and proficiency connected with your passion. And so, you know, you will be missed, uh, but you will not be forgotten because you have left an indelible mark on the division and the lives of students and staff. So thank you from myself and the board, and we appreciate your service and we wish you Godspeed. Yes, sir, thank you. All right, next item on the agenda uh, is, thank you, uh, Mac Baton um, and the students. Um, you saved me some money this year because I, I purchased them from Virginia Randolph every year, so I'm so happy that I get a Ponsetta for free. <laughs> um, <laughs> next item on the agenda is our public forum. Um, citizens had until 8 p.m., 8 a.m. this morning, excuse me, to submit comments to the board um, for our review uh, using a link on our HCPS website. Um, there were citizens who did take advantage of that opportunity, um, and we sincerely and seriously appreciate your input. Um, comments were compiled and provided to us prior to the start of today's meeting, and um, those comments um, have also been posted in board docs. Um, as of the cutoff time frame, we've received 51 comments, and those comments have been duly noted by those of us on the school board. The next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Uh, is there a motion that the minutes from November 12, 2020 work session be approved? So moved. The movement, Ms. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye to ayes have it. The minutes have been approved. Uh, next item on the agenda is unfinished business presented by the board. Uh, Ms. Atkins? No. Ms. Shea? Ms. Ogburn? No, thank you. Ms. Kinsella? No, thank you. Next item on the agenda is new business items presented by the board. Ms. Atkins? Mm -hmm. Ms. Shea? Ms. Kinsella? Ms. Ogburn? No. Um, next, before we have the announcement of our meeting dates, uh, I do know that Mrs. Shea had an announcement she wanted to make, and I will duly give that opportunity to my peers as well. Ms. Shea, you want to begin? 
Thank you, Reverend Cooper. I want to take a point of privilege to thank uh, my counterpart on the Board of Supervisors, Ms. Pat O'Bannon. Um, she has been instrumental in uh, securing and providing funding for two major projects at two of uh, my high schools. So uh, the first one is the replacement of the uh, gym bleachers at Godwin High School. Um, it replaced the original bleachers from the 70s. So those are um, installed and then currently being worked on is the auditorium lighting system at Douglas Freeman High School, replacing the original lighting from the 50s. And so I can't thank Ms. Um, O'Bannon enough for helping us secure those funds and invest in our students and um, all of their passions and talents. And I look forward to a time when we'll be able to um, attend events in the gym and the auditorium um, like uh, we have in previous years with these new improvements. That is awesome. Thank you so much for your sharing. Ms. Atkins, any announcements? Not at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Ogburn? No, thank you. Okay. Ms. Kinsella? None, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, next item on our agenda is the announcement of meeting dates. The school board's next meeting will be a work session that is scheduled on Thursday, January 14th, 2021 at 1 p.m. in the New Bridge Learning Center Auditorium. Uh, the meeting time may be adjusted if needed. We'll also hold a 5.30 p.m. Uh, public hearing to solicit input on proposed revisions to the 2018 through 2025 strategic plan. The school board has discussed the potential redistricting on hotspots since September 24th. A public hearing is scheduled for January 14th, 2021 at 6 p.m. to receive public input on two proposals focusing on effectively utilizing the additional capacity of the newly expanded Holiday Elementary School and addressing capacity issues at Colonial Trail and Rivers Edge Elementary Schools. The board welcomes your comments. This meeting is adjourned.